All right, this episode, Neil Pendleton and Jeff Paradis from Big Woods Bucks come on down, talk about their seasons. Um, they both had awesome seasons. Neil killed a buck he's been uh, after for many years. Great story there. Um, a giant buck, too, by the way. And uh, Jeff Paradis uh, hunted all over the place. We talk about his uh, Sitka deer hunt down in Maryland, hunted out in South Dakota with Rick Labby, and uh, hunted around home here quite a bit as well. Also, he went to Alabama uh, just after this podcast and did some hunting down there. So he's been all over the place. Between these two guys, just incredible deer hunting knowledge. Um, so we're going to get into that. But I want to also um, just use this time real quick, talk about the uh, film festival that we're doing uh, for Northeastern Hunters. We've locked in a $3,500 first place prize, a $1,000 second place prize, and a $500 third place prize. And um, the film festival, uh, sponsored by Vault, they put up all the prize money. Thank you to Vault. They're uh, a nootropic you know, brain-focused drink. Uh, obviously focus a great thing for uh, for deer hunters and um, this film festival really started to um, give northeastern hunters our own outdoors and hunting film festival um, there's some great filmmakers up here travel the country do some um, you know uh, enter enter film festivals all over the country prestigious ones but we want one of our own up here in the northeast so that's going to take place the night before hunt stock opens to the public at Wildwood Farm, so August eighth, Thursday night, eight p.m. at Wildwood Farm. Tickets are on sale for twenty bucks there. If you have a VIP pass to hunt stock, you get into that for free. It's included with that pass. And um, the basic uh, rules and parameters for the film festival: it's got to be shot in the Northeast. Um, it's got to feature northeastern game. You know, no high fence stuff. So it's got to be in the Northeast, wild game. Um, it's going to be heavy deer hunting, I'm sure. But anybody, you know, any game that you're hunting, um, and even if the film doesn't feature a hunt, it's got to be about hunting. Um, but um, it's just got to be all about the Northeast. Um, it's got to be from the 2023 season all the way up to the beginning half of 20. 24 so if you're hunting turkeys or whatever you can submit a film um on uh on your turkey hunts or spring bear um still opportunities to put a film together um the films are going to be judged on storytelling is the heaviest weighted category um with 50 percent. so 50 points out of 100 come from how well you uh, are able to tell your story there's cinematography in there um, worth 15%. It doesn't matter what kind of camera you use. You're not going to be docked points if you have a lower end camera versus a high end camera. The cinematography judging is, is simply on, um, the types of camera shots that you've chosen, how you framed it, things like that. Um, so we want this to be available for anybody who's self-filming. If you're just using a phone, that's fine. If you can tell a great story, um, and you know, you've got an eye for the lens, um, you're going to score well there as well. Then there's also the um, uh, wildlife footage and compelling footage category, which is another 15%. Um, so you've uh, uh, 15 might be 20. I've got all the details on the website. Go check the website for um, all the uh, details written down. I'm just doing this from memory right now since I'm in the, uh, <laughs> the studio booth here. But... Um, Basically, if you got good footage, uh, compelling wildlife footage in there, you know, that's a, a big component to how well the film's going to do. And then um, the other category is originality, new concepts, you know. So if it, is it a hunting film that took a different angle that we're not used to seeing or something that's new and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and just original, a new idea? then you're going to score really well there too. So um, we've got a panel of five judges. Um Tom Miranda, uh, world famous uh, bow hunter, will be one of the judges. He's put together many, many films, so he's a great, prestigious judge. We're happy to have. Um, he'll also be at Huntstock doing seminars, and then um, we got Chris Ford um, from Pilot Agency out of Boston. He's a, a big time hunter as well. He does a lot of work in the outdoor space, and uh, he's got a great eye for film. He's another judge. Um, John Lewis from Just Hunt Club is the third judge. 
Um, obviously, he's spent his whole career editing footage, putting out content, starting a Midwest Whitetail, now over at Just Hunt Club. So he's another great prestigious judge that we're excited to have on board. Um, Chris Borgatti, um, more from the conservation side of things. He's over at Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, um, running the Northeastern chapter. Uh, he's a great guy. He's um, very unbiased. He's going to see things from a little bit different of a lens. And then we're going to announce a fifth judge from outside of the hunting space who is in the filmmaking, film production, TV production side of things. But to just get a, a viewpoint from someone who isn't a hunter but understands all the other things that go into filmmaking, production, and things like that. So we get a... a, a a viewpoint from outside the hunting world as well. Um, so we'll make that announcement a little bit later of a date. If you want to submit your film, um, there's no time limit on it. Um, obviously I think if you can be somewhere around the 20, 30 minute time frame, you know, it's easier to keep someone's attention. So to score higher in that storytelling, um, category, uh, you need, <clears throat> need to keep people's attention the whole time. So obviously the longer you go, the harder that's going to be um, to get a high score in. So, you know, try to keep it under 30 minutes. If you need more than that to tell your story, by all means, take it. Um, but if you want to submit, you got to submit your film by June 15th, and you submit it by sending an email to Pat Burns, sev1, S-E-V-O-N-E, at me.com, M-E.com, sev1 at M-E.com. Either send him an unlisted YouTube link, load it up to your YouTube page if you have one, publish it as unlisted so only people with the link can see it, uh, or load it up to a Dropbox or some other file file sharing, uh, Vimeo, uh, whatever you like to use, and send the private link over to Pat Burns and uh, cchuntsuburbia at gmail.com and just say this is my official submission uh, for the film festival. We're going to take all those links, put them in in easy-to-navigate, spreadsheet and share them with the judges and they're all going to start watching them as soon as they come in and uh, submitting their scorecards and then at the film festival we're going to reveal the top 10 films in order nobody's going to know it not even me going into it um, what films are are in what place um, but it's just going to be sorted from the scores from the judges so uh, films 10th place all the way up to fourth place we're going to show a short version of the film so all filmmakers when you're submitting you have to submit two films so your full length film and then submit a short version that's under two minutes kind of like a trailer something that tells us the whole gist of the story it's a great editing exercise to get get your film down um to two minutes um anyway so submit both those films 10th place through fourth place we're going to show those shorter version films at the film festival and then we'll take an intermission we'll draw some door prizes um give people time to go to the bathroom, get a drink if they want to. And then we'll get back into showing and revealing the top three films at the first ever Huntstock Film Festival. And uh, those will all be shown full length films. So that full version you send over, those will be shown in full. And this is going to be the first time anybody has seen any of these films. It's going to be a special night. We're super excited about it. Um, but now let's get into this podcast with Neil Pendleton and Jeff Paradis from Big Woods Bucks. One more quick thing. Um, unfortunately, the camera did something funky when we were recording this podcast. Right at the end, the lens switched off, and we lost all the footage for it. So we're just going to roll some uh, uh, trail cam footage from my trail cameras this year. Got a lot of cool stuff on there. We'll roll that in the background, and this will be a, an audio-only podcast, so to speak. Um, on YouTube, you'll see some uh, trail cam footage. Now, here's the podcast. With hot. <clears throat> All right. Well, we got another episode of the Hunt Suburbia podcast. Neil Pendleton and Jeff Paradis came uh, came down for a ride, brought some stuff to show and tell, and we've got a lot of uh, great hunting stories to talk about on this episode too. Um, we were just going through Jeff's uh, <laughs> seek, seek a deer hunt down in Maryland, which yeah. is extremely unique. Yeah. Um, maybe I think that could be a good good place to to start out and talk yeah. about. How did that come about, and and what you think of the whole experience? Um, well, I, I went, I hunted with Ted Nugent quite a few years ago, and I went sick of deer hunting out in Texas, and um, <clears throat> I was, 
how I found out about Maryland is I was I went to Africa one year and I hooked up with two guys on the plane out there and one of the old boys out there was from Maryland and his name was uh, I think it was uh, Commander at the time his nickname and he asked me if I wanted to go sick of deer hunting out in Maryland I, I just never I never got the opportunity to go out there so I have two friends Greg and Matt <laughs> and they've been pressuring me to go out there to go uh, sick of deer hunting so this year I said uh, yeah so they had planned it for in September and of course that's right smack in the middle of archery season and I was out hunting out in uh, Illinois so I, I couldn't go at that time so <clears throat> They had, um, the season came up, they had a couple more seasons in the later part of the, um, that month, and uh, I had just texted uh, Matt, I said, hey, listen, you got any room, you guys going down there? And they said, yeah, sure, you're more than welcome to come down, so I said, I'm on board. So we had uh, packed up all our stuff, and we headed down there. And Greg was telling me, he says, listen, I don't know if you've ever done this before, but this is crazy stuff. He says, really? I said, I can't be that bad. He goes, no, you're hunting that frag grass, you know? It's like 10-foot high cat tail. Oh, it's like, the sh- it's like frozen spaghetti when you're in there. It's the worst shit you can ever imagine. Yeah, I saw the stem, the stem <coughs> oh, count, it's, dude. It's, a, <laughs> it's crazy. So they said, we got to, we got to, they had this one spot. It was on, on federal land. It's all public hunting. You know, free-ranging. These things are free-ranging. Um, they were actually established in the early 1900s in mm-hmm. Maryland. There's three places in the country that they were established. One was in Texas, one is in uh, Virginia, and one is in Maryland. And they were brought in Maryland, and, and um, they were put on this James Island. There was like five or six of them that were put there by a gentleman that imported them there. And they actually... they. They, they took off and now they they're they're into like they're in like 15,000 of them these things mm. that run around down there in the frag grass and the swamps and uh, <clears throat> and that's where you find them in the in the water in the swamps and they live right in that stuff so anyway we decided to get down there and they said pack your stuff up we're going we're gonna go in deep so I get up early in the morning and you got to hunt in hip waders yeah you know and uh, you, you hike in as far as you can. We pack all our stuff on, our our, um, our tree climbers, guns, you name it. And we're headed down in there. And <clears throat> you park out at the gate. They only open the gate up at certain times. There's only certain days that you come out on these, uh, these federal lands. And you got to kind of really know what you're doing. Um, they give out permits, so on and so forth, along with your Maryland hunting license. So we got up at four o'clock in the morning. We stayed at a little hotel there and in, in uh, down the road, and we drove to this gate. And we parked there, and we were, I think there was one other truck when we got there, and we packed our, all our stuff at. Well, it was like four thirty in the morning. It was dark, had lamps up. I said, "Greg, where are we going? We're going as deep as we can." I said, "All right." <laughs> and he's done this. He does it every they year. They were there last year. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So they have a little bit of experience the year, the year before that. So they kind of, kind of get it all figured out. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I had no clue it was going to be, you know, what was in store. But they kept, they kept saying this is, you know, this frag grass is the nastiest stuff you ever, you ever seen. I said okay. So we start hiking out, and it's, it was probably, by the time we were done, it was like two and a half miles. <clears throat> and you get into these swamps in the waters up to your waist, yeah. you know, because you have to have hip boots, and you got to get through this stuff. So where are you guys going for a destination? Is there something out there? Like, there's, I mean... Well, you what you do is you... the This frag grass, it's an evasive grass that that was... I don't know how it got there, but they try killing it every year. They burn it. They do everything, but it grows in the swamps. What you try to find is that frag grass. And that's where these sick of deer are in. They are in these 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 frag grass areas. If I can explain it to you how it is, I mean, I got it on video. I got I got a picture of it in it. It's kind of like frozen spaghetti. You're in that stuff. It's like the nastiest stuff. You can't see it. It's ten feet tall. 
Well, so then where do you choose to set up, though? Like, I'm thinking, like, hunting, like, you know, <clears throat> like, for a whitetail buck, right? You try to find, like, a peninsula, like, out in the swamp. It's, like, that sticks out there. But, like, where are you trying to find to set up and, and hunt? <laughs> I don't know if there's any... It's really... I don't know. I mean, you just get out there, yeah. you know? It's is, basic... there, is there runways or anything? <clears throat> like Yeah, there, 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 there are runways out there that they're... they're Typical, like a typical a white tail, a white tail run. You can you can kind of see it. Some of them are more predominant than others, but a sicker a sicker run. I mean, their yeah, their little... hoof is only as big as my thumb. For that. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's a big mature buck. <laughs> yeah. You know, he probably only weighs seventy pounds. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you're trying to find these little little runways or whatever in that grass, but they lay on the hummocks in there. So if you can find a tree, a dead tree. And look down below it, and you'll see where they've been laying. Yeah. And you can't see, for God's sake, you can't see five feet in front of you when you're down there. Yeah. Yeah. But you you had a climber with you too, so you had to have found some <clears throat> at least a couple of good trees. Did, did you get into some places where you know, yeah. all of a sudden there'd be a, a bigger rate, not just one tree hummock, but like a higher raised uh, island or something? So what he did is uh, <clears throat> ultimately what we did is we found an area was kind of like a transition. So there was frag grass, kind of open marshy, um, um, swampy area, then frag grass. So what the Sika deer would do, they would leave the frag grass, they would cut through these areas, and they'd go to the frag grass. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to catch them in between because you can kind of see them. Yeah, a little better shot. A little better shot. Still not the best shot, you know, but a little better shot. Yeah. But they're only, you know, the males are dark chocolate. Yeah. Little racks about this big, which are, you know, Boone and Crockett. You know, they're, <laughs> you know, they're crazy. No, not, not like that one? No, no. <laughs> so if the, I brought mine down, I wouldn't want to embarrass you. you know? yeah. So that one in the video, and yours too, but the one in the video that you got footage of that was just standing there and turned that, and looked at you, he looked pretty big. Are, do they get any more points than four ever? Because they, they look like well, they have you, spikes and then a little kickers in the front. Usually it's a, a, a three by three, so three okay. on each side. Yep. That one I shot is a two by two. Yep. Well, that has the length though, and which then is when, unique. And then yeah. to get a like kind of idea, when you say a three by three, is it like does their brows like and then a fork up top, or is it like like what does it look like? They look very similar to, uh, um, almost similar to. A, I don't know if you guys ever hunt red stag or whatever, but a, like a young red stag. That's what yeah. they are. That's basically what they are. Hmm. They roar like a red stag. They bugle, um, and if you get in that season when they're bugling, it's, it's fantastic. You yeah, know? Cause when I looked it up, like try to find some information and facts about them, I called them whistling hooligans because yep. they make a weird noise. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So were you? What time of year were you hunting it? It was. Oh, well, we're just down there not too long ago, last month. And is so. that that's post rut for them, or um, post ruts like around uh, Septemberish, you know, similar to whitetail, you know. They're, oh, like pre rut September, and yeah, then it's yeah. pretty similar rut, rut times. Yeah, okay. very similar, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, but we were down there on on post rut, so. Um, so what was the story? The one that you got then? Well, that was uh, yeah. So I end up. <laughs> I ended up hiking down. And I found a spot, so I set up on the edge of the frag grass, and I got up in a tree. And you know, of course, you got to go through all the water. You're always in hip boots because you're constantly wet. So <clears throat> I got in there, and I went up my tree climber, and I just sat there. And you sit there all day like we normally do, you know. Um, you can sit there all day, which we prefer to because we're just hardcore hunters, but. They typically move early in the morning and late afternoon. And typically in the afternoon, it's like last light. It's kind of like a big mature buck. You get kind of that window where they're kind of moving around. So uh, <clears throat> so I had found that spot. I, I kind of liked it. So I just sat there. And there was a lot of activity, a lot of rubs on trees um, in wallows in that particular area because they wallow just like an elk. Now, hold on, I'm trying to picture these rubs, like like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like this. <laughs> are, are they like, you well, know, yeah, if they come low. up to your kneecap, is that like a mature? That's pretty. That's high. That's probably a big one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any signposts? No signpost rubs. I looked everywhere for them. Couldn't find them. No, nothing. But yeah, they 
They don't rub on big trees, but if you find a tree the size of your thumb, that's a big mature one. <laughs> uh, are there whitetails around there at all, or no? And there are. There's a, in that area, or do they kind of like? Yeah, they have. Well, not really in the frag grass and stuff like that, but there are whitetails down around there. And mm -hmm. I guess, you know, Maryland has phenomenal whitetail herd down there. You know, mm -hmm. in the yep. thousands. So, but we're we're particularly you know going after the uh, yeah the. Um, yeah. The sick of deer. I'm just wondering if they kind of have their own territory, you know. That they do. They're naturally. They do. They actually the males, um, from what I was told, the males are very territorial. So if you hear one bugling or roaring, he they typically stay in that area. And if you can kind of move on him and get close to him, yeah, there's a good chance that he'd be right there, and you can kind of get on him. You know, mm. if you can bugle the way they bugle or. They squeak. the The females sound like a like a cow elk. You ever hear a cow elk? Mm -hmm. You know, like that. That's kind of how the females are. <clears throat> so some guys probably hunt them like elk during the rut. I yeah. imagine you yeah. have some some yeah. ways to do that. Yeah, <clears throat> it's amazing, hunt. It's amazing. So I had left my I left my stand there that that afternoon, and we had left. You know, and we come back that. The next morning, because <clears throat> you're so far in there, and to get through that stuff is like, I can't say enough how just difficult it is, you know, because you got 30 pounds. I had my cameras, I had gear everywhere, yeah. guns. Well, then you you're know, going through swamp muck too to boot. And you're going through, yeah, the, the mud was like crazy getting through that stuff. <clears throat> so <laughs> the next morning we get up early, and we're going to head back in there, and I had plot my course on my Onyx. And I always bring a, a second, um, a second GPS. I have a Montana that I have, and I, I've always used my Montana for everything until I got the Onyx. So I'm I'm still kind of getting used to the Onyx on certain aspects of it. And I actually had to yeah, I had to call him tutorial. on it. So <laughs> I had plotted my course to get out there. And on Onyx, they give you your um, they give you another your way back point. So, but what I did understand is that when you Put your way back point you have to press that that indicator twice mm -hmm. and that'll align your your, yeah. your phone yeah. yeah so it gives you the yeah. north south east oh, mm -hmm. well i didn't realize that all i got was the line yeah. so what i've been doing like a like a Pollock usually does <laughs> when i told him that he's like oh that would have made it a lot easier i know so what I've been doing is I've been seeing that line, and as you get closer, your yardage decreases, so you know you're getting closer to your stand. So yeah. that's how I've been doing it right along. It's been because I kind of somewhat a sense of direction in the woods anyway. So, but I got down and dude, I got down in that fragrass yeah. that morning. Right, <clears throat> Matt goes this way, and I'm going off to my stand, and I got in that stuff, and I got so tangled up that I was in there for an hour. Yeah. Right, going in circles, and I look yeah. up and I can see Matt way over there in the stand, his headlight going. I'm going, man. I know I'm going the right way, but I didn't realize I was, I was trying to get to my stand, but I'm trying to decrease my yardage. And, yeah. But I'm going in circles on that crap, and you yeah. can't see. It's like I'm telling you, it's like frozen spaghetti. Yeah. I never see anything like yeah. it. And you're fighting it like this, going through, going, Jesus. In the dark, yeah. Yeah. Finally, about an hour, I came out, and I came out by Matt's stand. I goes. <laughs> where the f is my stand he goes well you're over there i go oh my god he goes i've been seeing you out there for the last hour my headlamp going around i'm going geez i look like a complete we got a professional idiot. here yeah. <laughs> yeah professional yeah i've been doing this for 40 plus years yeah but not in frag grass not in frag grass yeah, yeah. Oh. so so that so we stayed in the stand and that that um that late afternoon and which is neat because Matt and, and Greg are always telling me, listen, you can hear them coming through that that water if you listen, you know, and you can hear them trickle like that. So <clears throat> I was set up in a big fir tree, and I could see through the, you know, the hemlocks and the frag grass, and you could see the water with the little hummocks everywhere. And you could see, as far as you could see below there, you could see the water out there. So I heard something way out in the swamp. I could hear a little trickling. I'm going, that's got to be a sicker. It, it's got to be a sicker. So I'm looking in the water, and you can see the ripples, you know. 
and it's it's kind of dark down, but you could see the ripples, and I'm going, there's something coming, you know? You've probably been in that situation where you could see things in the water. Yep. You can't see them, but you can see the ripples. So what I was doing, I was I was watching the ripples, and I was following the ripples back, so when they got tighter and tighter and tighter, that gives you an indication where that animal's coming from, and I could see the, the tightness of the ripples, and he's coming, you know? Then all of a sudden, I started seeing little legs. And no, swear to God, this big. You know, I'm going, yeah, I, you know, I thought it was a bird coming or something, you know. Uh, but coming through the thickest stuff that you could imagine and making no noise, just coming through that stuff, and all of a sudden he, he pops up on the little hummock, probably 12 yards in front of me, you know, and still in the thick. And at that point, I was already up, you know, on him with my Henry, and I have that. First time I ever used a peep sight with that high vis sight, yeah. and I'm glad yeah. I used it. This right here? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 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 So, yeah, the 360 buck hammer. So, um, Andy made this for me. Yeah. And with the way. peep sight, and I put a high vis sight on it. So, at low light conditions, this thing is just incredible. And when I picked up on him, it, all I could see was that high vis dot right on him. You know, at 12 yards, and he was still moving, and I just let it go, and that was the end of the game. Yeah, I can't imagine that uh, a 70-pound sick of bucks going to survive yeah. that at 12 yards. No. You know, with a buck no, hammer. He's trying, trying to interrupt the story. <laughs> yeah. So, you can't um, answer for Hal. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say, should we pick up and say, say hi to Hal real quick? Is that Hal calling? Yeah. You can answer. Go for it. Hey, Hal. Yo. What are What's you going doing? on? Just got in. Oh, we're just sitting here doing a podcast. Oh, nice. Yeah, so we saw, we saw you were calling. We're sitting down here with, with Pat Guyette and Jeff, and we're, we're doing the podcast, but saw you were calling, figured we'd answer. Just, he, Jeff just got done telling his sick of stag story. Oh, nice. Yeah. Hey, Hal, you're, you're, you're on the podcast right now. You're live the tape. All right. Well, I guess you don't care who you guys hang with, huh? <laughs> Definitely not. No. Nope. But we just figured we'd have you make a special guest appearance since you were calling. All right. How's it? Everything's going good. Oh yeah. yeah. Jeff is just showing off his Henry. All right. We brought the guns Killing down. Killing coyotes with it. Oh yeah, I've shot a couple of those things with it too. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got a couple, a couple nice ones with that. The uh, coyotes, they can't take that 360. That you know, oh, no it way, rolls them right over. <clears throat> Hal, are you on coyote duty right now? Uh, we've been a little bit, but we were getting crusts earlier. We just got started a couple of weeks ago, and and uh, and we've got some, but uh, now the snow's getting good. You know, it's getting deeper. It's uh, no, I don't know. Out in the open is 20 inches or so, and under those trees is half of that. But right now, it's good for the, it's still good for the deer. The deer are doing great. They're not even really yarded up. I still got deer right behind my house up here. Huh. They're never here. they're never here going into February. Usually, they're out of here by December, you know. Yeah. So but there there ain't mm-hmm. enough snow to keep them you know hunkered you know they can walk around they don't even need to walk in trails they just walk around and feed it's it's really good for them i wonder if uh you think you're you think you still got some big snowstorms coming and they might still yard up or you think it might be one of those weird years and they don't yard up at all i think now usually when you get this late for some reason they know and some of them could head down like from my house to get to town only you know, 15-minute walk for them. They could, if we got a big snow, they could head down. But there's a lot of deer that are still, like, way out in the middle of nowhere. Hmm. And I think those deer will stay there. They'll just hunker in a softwood thicket, you know, a few at a time there. And and uh, when it's like that, it's harder for the coyotes to find them because the coyotes usually follow them down to the deer yards and they know where they are. But, yeah, I think it's... Uh, it's really good for the deer. Yeah, we've had some easy so, winters. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to get, I mean, we're only 
going into the first of February here. February can be a snowy month in March. We can have two months of pretty good snows, but we'll see. We'll see. So you, far, so good, and you know they're in good shape. Yeah. So be pretty hard now for them to get struggling because they could probably as they probably haven't lost any fat. They could probably lay down the rest of the winter and yeah. sleep. You know. Are, are you guys all booked up next year for uh, for the guiding business yet? Mostly, I've still got some openings. Uh, Thanksgiving week that always books up last. A lot of guys can't go Thanksgiving week, and but uh, most everything else, I might have a spot here or there, but pretty much booked up. Yeah, because it sounds yeah. sounds like it's going to be a healthy herd and some big racks next year. Probably some good weight to all the bucks. It'd be a good year to get up there and track them. There's definitely some oh, deer yeah. up there. I, I saw a good healthy herd when I went up there. My first trip ever hunting up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we got plenty of deer here, plenty of them. I scored a rack for a guy that, oh, he's got a camp down the Forks area, but it was a nice one. It scored 148 gross and 144. That beautiful 10-pointer. He said it only dressed 160 pounds. And, uh, like, the end of was the end of the of November. I think it was he shot it with a muzzleloader, but last year muzzleloader season was yeah, we had the whole week in, in November kinda like which would normally be Thanksgiving week like it'll be this year. <laughs> so Well, the yeah. racks will be big next year for sure if the snow hangs off and they, they don't have to go yard up. Oh yeah. Yeah, they'll it's it'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, I won't hold you guys up. I know you got a lot going on there. Oh yeah, we, we have plenty of stories <laughs> yeah, to tell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, pre- appreciate it, Hal. That's the first uh, official time Hal's been on the podcast. We got to do one together, uh, you and I, at some point, if uh, if you're up yeah. for it. But we'll figure it out. Yeah. First special guest appearance for Hal Blood. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, yeah. Al. Hey, no problem. <clears throat> All right, take it yeah. easy, Al. See ya, boss. Yeah, we'll see ya. Bye-bye. I love there that. There we go. I love that main accent. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Coyote. Coyote. Is that K-I-O-T-E? Coyote? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you know, that was, I, was, I was really excited for Jim Massett for a lot of reasons, but to interview him, just that that great accent that yeah. old americana yeah. accent he has is just yeah. great yeah, it's for, awesome yeah great on the microphone yeah well, it's like you don't get as many of those unique accents anymore i mean no no but if you just listen to our three we all sound completely different here too but i don't think it's as cool as the it's not as distinct. yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah my buddies out, out west they they love listening to you talk you know hey say this say that <laughs> like, yeah. yeah but yeah so so that that was a good hunt it was um, it was fun. It was challenging. Easy uh, drag though, comparatively, right? <laughs> oh yeah, that's did you, did another you do the story. Now you can do the gymnastics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that'd be easy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I dragged that thing for I don't know two miles. Of course, I was going in circles because I still had my GPS figured out. Did you drag it or just carry it? Well, by the time I got, I <laughs> no, I dragged it. I threw a uh, string on it. <laughs> Not a rope. <laughs> So I'm looking up my onyx, I'm going, well, i got to go over there. So I went over there. (laughs) Then uh, I must have dragged for, I don't know, an hour and a half. And those guys are already at the truck, and I'm still in there, you know. Then Greg comes back up. He goes, where are you? I says, well, I I think I'm at this point. I took, I screenshot it, and I gave it to him. I said, oh, you only went a couple hundred yards. I goes, son of a bitch. I said, I've been dragging for two hours, for God's (laughs) sakes. I've been going in circles. (laughs) And that, so that's when I figured out that the next day I got a hold of him. I says, yeah. Neil, yeah. there's got to be a way that Onyx, oh, yeah. you know, <clears throat> and sure enough, you do this, do that. You it's point like, it just like a flashlight. It's yeah. Like, oh, I'm going right yeah. there. Well, it's well, different. I mean, because what we were talking about in, you know, be cool Onyx features, like with the old Garmin's, did you ever use one of those 
the Garmin GPS's. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you point it at whatever you want, it counts down. Just you literally just have the big arrow, yeah. and you just you know whatever direction the arrow points, you yeah. walk, and it, and it counts down on you. Well, that's how my Montana is. Yeah. You know, and I've used the Montana for years, and I've always been you know comfortable with it. Yeah. But transitioning over to Onyx. And I don't like the, I like Onyx a lot, but I just hate having my phone with me. It's just kind of an electronic leash. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Because yeah. <clears throat> um, being in business for that long, I mean, just. It's a way to escape and get away yeah, from it. Yeah, it's like and... a phone to me is like you're putting your fingers down chalkboard. Mm-hmm. So. It is so true, though, when you bring a phone. I mean, I, I do it, and a lot of the, every young guy does it, I guess. But uh, you're yeah you're tethered to whatever your business is yeah, while you, you're there you're you're doing this yeah yeah I just soon leave it alone we're uh, like we're in uh, uh, Rick and I went uh, Nebraska I just left the phone back because it ain't going you know so yeah so so what did you for this season I mean cause I couldn't even keep track of all the different states that he's in and that's one thing about being a team member is it's uh, like you know you're constantly it's like every other day somebody's shooting a buck it's like but you know. You know, a lot of them are in New England, but then of course you get a couple of the guys. They travel all over. And oh yeah, like it's hard to even keep up with what yeah. state they're just in. Just keeping up with you and Rick is. Yeah. You know, well, Rick. Well, Rick is he's, he's a whole nother Rick, animal. Yeah. yeah. I don't expose myself like Rick does. <laughs> <laughs> but he's awesome. He's uh, we had a lot of fun together out there in Nebraska and South Dakota. I can't say how much fun we had. It was a you lot got of fun. muleys in Nebraska, right? Yeah, muleys. Yeah. We were uh, Nancy's wife shot a nice one. You know, it was all beat up, but we worked our tails off out there, no doubt, um, in Nebraska for the uh, muzzleloader. So that was a lot of fun. We shot a, uh, <clears throat> a Rick and I shot shot Rick shot a nice muley in South Dakota. And I shot a, a cocker buck. Um, um, big, uh, I don't know how many points that thing was, but he was like, he was a beautiful buck. That was a nice buck. Heavy, yeah. super heavy. That was the one down like the draw in front of you, right? Yeah, that was yeah. Uh, <clears throat> old, like kind of gray faced, like white yeah. tail. Yeah. 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 That was a cool video. Yeah. Yeah. We got that all on video. Yeah. He was actually across. Has that video come out or that's one? No, no, no they're, uh, yeah. Mine don't rank as high as Rick's. Mine's yeah. down below, so we got to get Rick's out <laughs> of the way. Then mine. Rick, Rick he, he actually just posts all, all his stuff. It's yeah. like he. He posts the clips up there, but trying to find yeah. something to edit. That's why I was working on, on his uh, his Sika deer. It's yeah. like because I'm like, just send me your, send me your stuff, and I'll see if I can go through and edit it. And you know. yeah, you want to talk about like just you saying you it's hard to keep up with everybody. Imagine you know Brian and whoever's handling all the editing yeah. parts of it now. That's yeah. that's got to be yeah. You know, that's it's a tough fun job. though. I mean, we've been blessed that we could do it. You know, and I'm I'm happy for guys that can do it. You know, mm-hmm. I've I've done it my entire life. Once you learn, and you know, I've hunted New Hampshire my whole entire life, Maine, Massachusetts, you know, everywhere. But <clears throat> once you have that opportunity to go places, yeah, and uh, oh, you've been other places now, and you understand. Yeah. I mean, it's there's nothing like it, you know. And you take all that wisdom and knowledge with you, um, because no doubt that we in New England, we there's we hunt so hard. And we, to, we yeah. put our time in, and if if you figure, I mean, there was one year that I logged in, in my stand, I logged in, and I, I charted, it was over 300 hours archery hunting in New Hampshire to see nine deer, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And that's when we didn't have a lot of deer around. But <clears throat> no doubt, and we, we definitely, um, we're definitely, um, we get it going on, you know? We just, because you're in tune to... Not a lot of deer per square mile, so you have to be vigilant on a lot of different things. So if you take that experience and go somewhere else, and I'm not saying it's easy, but your work ethic is totally different. Oh, yeah. I mean, you ask the guys, my buddies out where I go, you know, my camp out there and stuff like that, they've never seen anything like it. You know, they just say, well, how do you see all the deer, Jeff? Yeah. Because well, I stay in the woods all day. You know, and you're constantly moving and transitioning and stuff like that. Yeah, because for us, it's just that's just a normal day. <clears throat> it's of just hunting. normal day for us. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you're constantly trying to move to figure out what you can do next. I mean, what the new strategy is. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> and we, we don't. I mean, back when I started, we didn't have the technology, so it was boots on the ground. You learned everything. And the, I remember the day that the 
I don't know if you guys remember it, but they had these little devices. They were timers with strings on them. Oh, well, yeah, I heard about them, but I never So you used to buy those things. By, I bought 30, 40 of them in a whack, and a, any, any trail that I had, I'd put it across, and I would kick out the dirt right on that trail with a stick or something like that and to see what would pass through and trip that string off. Yeah. You know? Oh, you're doing that so you can see the track. You can see the track, yeah. and then you could educate yourself on the yeah. track because you, after a while, you figure what a, a, a doe looks like, a buck looks like. You see all that stuff. Yeah. And that's when we're doing on dry ground. And then, I mean, I never met Hal. I never know who Hal was tracking that ability and stuff like that. It's just a, you know, but we did everything on dry ground. Yeah. And we both got into tracking later in our hunting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And you, because how'd you start off hunting, anyways? I, I haven't heard oh that. Oh God, before. I mean, I started. I was, I think, eight years old. Yeah. Yeah, I still have my two original bows that I've I started with. I have a, a Browning Cobra and a Browning Stalker. They're wooden. Browning, sp- huh? They were Browning. doing bows, yeah. Yeah, they were big back then. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I still got to hang up my room. I wouldn't shoot them for for nothing. They'd probably blow up on you if you shot. You know, but. Yeah collectors i don't know well, you've got one of the coolest trophy rooms man cave whatever <clears throat> house now i guess that you, yeah you, you can no, even yeah, call it unbelievable yeah 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 i haven't seen your new one but that i'm that your trophy room in your old house was just yeah oh no awesome. it's a new place it's wicked cool when you walk in just because all the raised ceilings and there's yeah. like that what do you call it like the the mezzanine area yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 well we wanted to well you've been uh, the old house here and what my wife and i decided to do is that we will i mean we wanted everybody else to enjoy it too, you know. Instead of keeping everything in a little room, so yeah. And of course, our new house we I built that like three years ago, so we it's a little bigger, a little bit more roomy, and you get that that atmosphere, and you walk in because I mean we're all about outdoors and hunting, and your life is about it, Neil's life is about it. It's kind of like a lifestyle that we live. Yeah. So. <clears throat> You try. We wanted to express ourselves that way and and let everybody else enjoy it, you know. Because there's there's so many stories behind everything, you know. I mean, yeah. like you look at Rick's stuff, and Rick's stories are just endless. And Rick's Rick is um, Rick is like North American big game, and I'm a little bit different. I like. I kind of bring a big, broad picture. I like, I do anything, you know, like the challenge of the sick deer hunt, you know, yeah. uh, mountain lion hunting, you know, you name it, going to Africa, all that stuff, you know, it's just kind of cool, you know. Yeah. So it brings a different, a different perspective to it. Um, yeah, so it's 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 fun, you know. What well, you were saying about going west, like when I, I fell in love with North Dakota. Now I just I, I loved it, the experience yeah. going out there. I even. You know, I didn't have great service, so you would download your map, yeah, and which was also good because you get I disconnected from my phone out there. You didn't even really even have time, you know, time to look at your phone there because you're glassing, glassing most of the time. Yeah. And what I learned the most, what I really liked about it, you know, we didn't kill any deer. There was a, it was a bad EHD year the year before, so that makes it tough. I mean, the, real tough. There were only we only found three white tail bucks the whole time. They were bachelored up, but we had opportunities at them almost every day, and we hunted. We were in position to kill the the only yeah. three bucks. We, I shot at one. Um, Dan, my buddy Dan, shot and he hit one. I I just missed. It was a. 40 yard shot and through the grass and last light I, I i totally missed mine but we all we were on opportunities and what i really liked about it was what when you're glassing for that long you see how they're you just really you get a big picture view on how they're using the <coughs> landscape or yeah. here we're piecing together little micro pieces from our cameras and from a sighting over there but because of our forested you know all the forest yeah. cover we don't get to see how they use it the landscape from a distance as a, as a like a giant macro it's a, it was really cool yeah, it's like you're playing some kind of snow a... on the ground it's like then yeah. it's like it kind yeah. of expands your, your mind that's true i mean cause yeah. i know you know growing up stand hunting you know for me it was you just find a spot and you sit and so you think about like that immediate area around it and yep. just you know it's like what's going on on that piece of woods per se but you really don't think and back then as a kid like i didn't really the concept of bucks traveling it's like as far as they actually do when the snow on the ground, you get a top on that track and finally go miles and miles and 
whether it's down here in suburbia, it's like where you walk around, they're cutting in, you know, people's yards and, yeah. you know, going across roads yeah. I and mean, all over the place, or yeah. you go up in the big woods and, you know, it's nothing for them to go up and down a couple mountains in the course of a day. And Not at yeah. all. And you just see how they covered, like we were watching this giant cornfield that was a mile and a half away down yeah. these crazy ravines and across the big rivers. And we're watching that. Once we, it took us even a few days to figure that out with our spotting scope. Is that a cornfield way over there? Yeah, it is. That's what we got to be watching because we're yeah. trying to figure out what they were eating at that point. Mm. And in the mornings, we—that's when we when we finally honed in on that cornfield. We were watching from so far away, but you'd see, oh, yep, yeah, there's something. And then of course we were like, is it a mule? Every every day we were fighting. That's a buck, but ah, oh, shit, it's a muley. We only had white tail tags. Yeah, we would see mule deer yeah. using the same yeah. feed food sources and stuff. But you see them. And they would cross this whole plateau very quickly, you know, just cover all this distance quickly. And they're just walking, but you just, when you see it from a distance, it's yeah. like, all right. And then it was cool to see three bachelor up bucks. Those two are going to go, and we could see the draws. There's like one of four draws they're going to come down. And, you, and every day it was random. They didn't have one that was like their favorite. It's like one buck might branch and hit that first draw and come down we yeah. watch him bed yeah and then two more would just go across the plateau and then they would go down the same draw but it, every day was kind of random one yeah. draw they yeah. went down and it made me remember, think when i come came back here i was like wow now i'm gonna go back to i can't wait to get back to the northeast yeah home. that's key and you know i'll look at just even looking at draws differently just look at them yeah. a little bit <clears throat> differently where they're betting in the draws yeah. and why they're using them and yeah well to your point is, I mean, I started really learning whitetail habitat, whitetail, um, anything whitetail is when I started going other places. Because what happens is that you have the opportunity to study more of them. And you study the little nuances and the little things that they do that you don't have the opportunity back home because our deer per square mile is is not as high uh and when you see them deer around here it's usually you know short lived you know yeah well i feel i feel like too it's like the patterns like change so quickly around here i feel like deer it's like within two or three days whatever they're doing wherever they're at it shifts and it's completely different but I, that's what I noticed. The, the well, there's times a lot that, of pre- a pressure too, and yeah. when you're out west, it's not as uh, it's, I'm not saying everywhere, but a lot of times there's not as much pressure, so the deer are relaxed, so you get to see the little things that they do. Yeah. That you can take all that knowledge back then, and for me, it was like it was like I was like an encyclopedia. Yeah. You know, my first hunt when I traveled was South Carolina, and I, I've never saw that many deer in my entire life. I mean, I've been chasing deer my whole yeah. entire life, and to put 300 hours and see nine deer and yeah. all of a sudden they see yeah. nine deer in the first 15 minutes so it's like oh you know it was a sticker shot mm-hmm. but you can read their body language and and that's that is just crazy stuff you know and you can't get that on a computer you can't get that on a phone you can't you have to you have to see that that's boots on the ground that's what a lot of the old timers the old guys you know they've they've learned that through you know, failures and stuff like that, which is... And that's the biggest way you learn, through making yeah, mistakes learned... and failing. I mean, that's like, I mean, for instance, like like this buck, right? I mean, I mean, it was the third time was finally the charm on him. Yeah. I mean, it took me making mistakes, it's like, to go and learn. I mean, it was more kind of where I was sitting and stuff, but it's like you always learn, and those lessons from making those mistakes sticks with you, and I mean, I think yeah. that teaches you more than success. It does. But, I mean, like, even when I went to Ohio, it's like I traveled there twice, and you know, it's just learning in that week because I think that is the one thing too. When you travel somewhere and you go to a different state, you have that limited window of time, right? Yeah. And you want to maximize that opportunity, so yeah. it does. It's like if you're lucky, you stuff comes together, and that initial plan maybe happens on the first or second day. But normally, you just got to throw that plan out the window, and then you got to figure out, okay, by the end of the week, it's like what can I, what can I do? It's like, and what's happening here, and how do I have to shift and make it happen? And it is it's it's yeah it's and that's where your new england too, drive comes in that, it does, that yeah. drive it that's and it's unmatched i mean i, I truly it's like uh, we go places you can have, ask rick i mean we go to places and they, they see that your motivation you drive and they're like you yeah. know yeah they're getting up why, early why, why like, are you going know, out for a morning hunt you know we yeah, only go out in that? the evening yeah. here it's like oh. Gee, i know i was in south dakota i'm sitting i'm 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 hunting down in the bottoms you know and i'm 
That's where all the whitetail are, and Rick's hunting the muleys, right? And I got a picture of them, and I'm I'm sitting there. I've been there for four or five hours, and all of a sudden I look up. I'm going, who the hell is that way out there on top of the ridge cutting up in front of me? It was Rick. Yeah. He's way, He started way the hell over here, and he's out in front of me, and then he goes... <laughs> I said, what are you doing out there? He goes, ah, I'm just looking for that muley. <laughs> I said, man, you're just a machine. Yeah. yeah. But, but that drive, you know. That was a weird thing in North Dakota. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the drive that you have. Here I'm sitting all day on a stand doing my technique, and it was very successful, right? Yep. And they're freaking out because we're sitting all day, and they're like, well, I don't have guys that do stuff like that. And here's Rick. And he's hustling, and both scored, you know, on tremendous bucks. Yeah. Because my drive was different than his drive, yeah. but it's just that New England drive that we have. And I'm not saying that that guys well, no, but, I mean, you hear out about west it. I mean, and you know that's they why don't like have that drive. There are travel from the Midwest to come necessarily hunt. Yeah, you don't see those big you know, guys coming yeah. up hunting in New is, England. It's a lot harder. Yeah. It's like the skiers and the snowboarders that <clears throat> grew up doing yeah. it in the Northeast. Um, they end up being the best because they ski on harder conditions here yeah. and yeah. in icier conditions. So once they get into the, you know, the great yeah. powder of the of the west on those mountains, they're yeah. they're already ahead of the game because yeah. they learn to ski yeah. on ice. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of that, and it was really weird being in North Dakota. And then there's opening day. Well, opening day there is mid. It's it starts at noon, so you can't even hunt in the morning in the opening day anyway. But then the next two days, not. <clears throat> I, my instinct was to be out there in the dark in the morning, and they're like, "No, no, no, no! Like, we you have to glass in the mornings here. You got to see where the deer are, spot and stalk, and then go, you know, set up a plan for the afternoon." But I wanted so bad, it felt like I was wasting time. And then, and then I wasn't because it, it makes sense. You do you have this v- vast view of the landscape, and yeah, you got to get the intel in the morning. It's very valuable for that when you're spot and stalking. But then after like the third day of doing that, and I saw that they were coming from the cornfield every time. Yeah, I was like, "All right, guys, I'm you, gonna go hunt the morning." Yeah. And even a couple of my my buddies yeah. were like, "The wind isn't that great for that." I'm like, "Dude, we're only here for another four days. Yeah, I know they're happen. feeding up there in that cornfield." I'm yeah. like, "Go up that draw. The wind is not bad. It, it's it's a cutting wind, you know." And I think it's going to be fine. Plus, we're only here for a few days. So I, I picked out a bush that we could. We were watching this bush from all, you know, yeah. the, the whole day of scouting. Yeah. I think I remember you saying, like, you actually saw the bush on Onyx, too, right? Yeah. Like, you could actually yeah. see, like. Oh, yeah. 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 And you could just see the draw. It was pretty easy to, to get up there. And so I went that next day when that wind was supposed to be bad. And boy, it was the first time we heard elk bugling, too. We had seen elk the whole trip. They'd, they'd been down in the river below us, just sparring and laying down in the river and stuff and we saw a ton of elk but none of them were bugling yet that morning that i snuck all the way up there there were elk coming out of that cornfield too and they bugled i got that on yeah. footage somewhere um before sunrise bugling that was sweet and then 10 minutes into legal shooting bucks come buck comes out of that cornfield right on the corner i'm in this little bush He's, but he's 55, 60 yards away, and I wasn't going to take a shot there. He, he jumps this little fence row, and then he turns, and he starts coming down the fence row. And, yeah. uh, you know, I pick up I'm, – I'm on the ground, and I pick up my, my bow to turn, and we've got just regular grass, but it's kind of noisy if there's if it's not windy yeah. up there, just yeah. that regular – moving that, he yeah. he, he picked, oh. picked me off, and I didn't get a shot at it. But I – put myself in the opportunity to do it you're only there for the yeah. a certain amount yeah. of time you know where they're coming from betting you, you gotta take yeah. the aggressive yeah. yeah well how did you like the muleys aren't they super cool aren't they cool yeah their really best cool. defense is to stay still and watch and don't move it was, there was i saw so many muleys <laughs> yeah, they're there. crazy animals yeah yeah see, i don't have any experience with muleys really oh they're, like they're a, a lot different, yeah. they're a different lot of they're a lot of fun to hunt you know i had i had a probably a booner muley at, at 60 yards um, and a bunch of really nice muleys there too i was hunting in a county in north dakota that's got the state rec the state bow record muley and the um i think it also the rifle record is right near there too but anyway this this ranch that i'm that i'm on is known for big producing giant muleys it's a bow hunting yeah. only ranch and 180s 12,000 yeah. acres yeah. you know yeah. So they they they've got big muley, good muley territory, and there are big muleys everywhere. We we were unlucky to not draw a muley tag 
It's a 50%, basically 50% chance of drawing a muley tag for a non-resident and none yeah, of us got one. They're starting to change all those Midwestern states now. It's getting more and more difficult. Yeah, there was a big article I saw there not too long ago about all the big Midwestern states. Their allocations are changing. Hmm. They want to go more towards residents and less non-residents. I can see. I can see why. Yeah. yeah. Well, we guys talk muleys. I'm, I'm going to run to the bathroom real quick. All right. I drank a little too much on <laughs> water on the way here. So. All right. Then we'll hit your uh, invincible yeah, buck story yeah. when you get back. Back tea floating? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, <clears throat> I always enjoyed the muleys. They're, they're kind of a different animal, you know. Hey, Hal here. Finally got some new good news for all you. Our jackets are finally in. It's been a long process, but we got them done and got them right with all our new features and stuff in them. So uh, some of the new features we added was a game pouch in the back you can access from inside with, with dividers in it. It's just like the original one. Mine's the original one, not the new one. It's got your slash front pockets where you can get in and get at your GPS or whatever you carry in your front ones. They're all lined with the pockets aligned with uh, Microtech fleece, so it's nice and nice and warm on your hands when you put it in. Microtech's fleece. Uh, got your slash pockets here. Just 100% wool, virgin wool. Uh, I think they call it's 100% virgin wool, but it's 80, 85% wool with some nylon to make it stronger tight woven and uh, the vest I don't have the vest on it the vest snaps on your orange cape comes with it and uh, we're gonna have the green checkered jackets come in 22 ounce wool and we have plain green forest green same color as our pants that are coming and those are in uh, 18 ounce, a lighter wool, so you can have a three season jacket or four seasons jacket. And uh, the pants will be coming in a couple weeks and just in time for deer season. So get them ordered up and we'll get them shipped right out to you. Good luck on the trail. Hey folks, Rick Glabby here from Big Woods Bucks. I'm here today to tell you about our new packs. This is our new small pack, which the first time I saw it, Chris showed it to me and I said, that's the Nuna because that's the perfect pack if I'm getting on a butt track at noon. And uh, it, it, it'll hold the sandwich, your water, a little bit of gear. It's uh, virgin wool, made in USA, waterproof resistant, has a liner on the inside. Um, it, it's a great pack. This pack... This is our newest large pack, which um, when I used to carry the older pack, I always wore suspenders because it bothered my hips a little bit. So we designed one with shoulder straps, and this is a great pack. It takes the weight off your hips, puts it onto your shoulders. It's got a uh, GPS pouch right here in the top you slide in. Same deal, it's, it's water resistant on the inside, got that liner. Um, it's a perfect pack. So I go to bigwoodsbucks.com, get yours today, and I'll see you on the track. I you thought they would I I always heard or thought that they they you know dumber than a whitetail or easier to hunt and then you you, you just they're they're uh, maybe easier to see and maybe you know yeah uh, <clears throat> it might seem easier because they live in that wide open country yeah. but but then try to spot and stalk one. I mean, you know you've done it. Yeah. What do you think? Are they are they easier than a white tail to a white tail? Um, they're just a different. I mean, white tails are they're always on they're always in flight or flight mode. You know, they're always on edge, and muleys are just a little different, the little different breed. Um, I, but they're just as cagey as white tails. You know, um, Spot and stalk is not that easy on them. Some cases it is. I mean, of course, you're a bow hunter. 
a bow hunter. Spot and stock a muley bow hunting is it that's not easy, yeah. you know. Yeah, I, I did like that. The rifle would be a lot easier, but if you're yeah. if you're bow hunting, spot yeah. and stock anything isn't easy. Yeah. Yeah. I did that up in uh I got a friend that lives in southern Alberta. I hunted the Badlands up there in the canola fields. And uh, <clears throat> I went up there. Derek said, hey, let's go, let's come on up. We'll go mule deer hunting. So I got up there on a guest visa. He's a resident, and he can, um, he's allowed it, like, I think every three years. So I went up there with my bow and mule deer, mule deer hunting in those, uh, in the canola fields. And I don't know if you've ever been in the canola fields yeah. up there. Yeah, they're amazing. You know, they're just kind of a... They're a nasty bush, you know, and they plant miles and miles of it. So we got permission to hunt on this. It was um, the Mennonites up there. They owned a lot of country. I think they were they were in the over a million acres, you know. So it's free ranging and stuff. So anyways, what you do is similar to what you do. You spot the muleys, and <clears throat> you spot them in the morning. And what they do is they'll after morning they go and they'll they'll go to an area and they'll bed down so we had spotted this he's probably 180 inch muley but it was kind of non-typical and he was way out there so and we got a picture of him in the spot and scope so what you do is there is in the canola fields they have these big boom sprays and they're like 50 feet on each side and when they go through the canola fields, they desiccate the fields, which they kill it before they harvest it. So it takes a while for, you know, for the field to, to die. Then they come by and harvest it. So what happens as they go through the field, they leave these little trails on their tires. They're about 12 inches wide. And what you do is when you look for that muley, he'll go bed down. So this particular muley bedded down in this little bowl. And now what you got to do, you're probably a mile away on a spot and scope and see this thing. Now you got to, you have to get to him. And you're talking just miles of rolling hills and, you know, through this canola field. <clears throat> what you try to do is you try to pick the right boom trail, the tie trail, because he's within, yeah. you know, you got, you know, the tie, the trails are... X amount wide, like 15 feet wide or so, but each boom is 50 feet. Yeah. So you, he, if you're 50 feet, you could be, a, he could be 100 feet old. But what you're trying to do is pick that right trail to go down and sneak to him. So we were, we had, we got out there and we're fighting through the canola, and we got to one, one spot where we could kind of peek our head over, and we'd look down. And we're looking for the bowl. And, of course, that, that buck is bedded down there. And he's on the other side of the bowl. And you can't see him. And we're looking. And we spent probably an hour and a half glassing. And, of course, you know glassing. It's it's kind of an art, you know, once you figure it out. Yeah. Because it's, it's segmented. You know, you're segmenting, segmenting yep. as you're going along. And finally, we caught him. We caught the top of his antlers in that canola just sitting there. I saw something move like that, and it yep. was him. He was totally on the other side. He was probably 250 yards. <clears throat> now the game's on. So we're looking back, and we're looking at the the boom trails, and we figure we're too far over one side, so we had to crawl through the canola, and you're fighting that crap, and it's, your bow's getting caught. Everything's getting caught. Finally picked the right boom trail. Then... Derek, I said, stay here, and I'm going to go, because you don't want two guys on him. You just want to get up on him, you know, and you have to take your time. So you, you're actually crawling. So I crawled like 200, 250 yards on my hands and knees mm -hmm. through that through that trail, because the canolas, you know, it's up to your, some cases it's up to your chest or your waist, but it kind of rolls in down the boom trails, and you're kind of down there, and you you feel like a, a friggin' field mouse, you know? Yeah. A 200-pound field mouse going there, yeah. dragging your bow and everything down through there. It's catching on everything. I, I don't know how long it took. It took a long time to get there, you know? I'm going to say it took me probably two and a half hours, three hours to go that far on my hands and knees. Oh, I can imagine. And <clears throat> I got down. I figured he was up on a hill. 
and I could just barely see the tip of his antlers about that much. Were you stopping to check every like hundred yards to make sure? I would he was stop still to bedded? check to see if he was there. And one time I got down through there, all of a sudden he, I, I look up, poke my head up through the canal. He's standing up. I'm going shit. I'm still like 150 yards away, and there's no way I'm making the shot with my compound that far. And well, what they do is, he's repositioning self himself so he can lay back down. Yeah. So what he did is he he just like a dog does, you know, go in a little circle. And kind of get comfortable and yep. sit back down. So, so what I did is, and I just kept going on. And you're trying to be super quiet, you know. So I got within sixty yards of him, and I I stuck my head about, and I'm ranging. I could see his antlers. I could range the top of his antlers, and it was like sixty, sixty-two yards, and that was as far as I I did to go, you know. Because in that bowl, the the wind kind of swirls. It yep. does this. It does that. I didn't take a chance going any, any farther. <clears throat> so I'm sitting there, you know, kind of like almost crossed up like this. My bow's here. It's already loaded up. I'm kind of hang. It's hanging on the canola, you know, like yeah. sideways. Yeah. Then it had to been, I don't know, it felt like an hour and a half, you know. It definitely was an hour. And I just, I'm kind of playing in the dirt, drawing pictures in the trail, you know, just killing time, you know. And I happened to look up, and the son of a gun, he stood up. He's going to reposition himself. I said, well, it's now or never. I got no time. And so I kind of got on my knees. I drew back just as I drew back. And I had everything dialed in at 62 yards. Just as I drew back, he was just going down, and I let that arrow go. It went over the canola, and I hit a whack like that. And nothing. <clears throat> just dead silence so you, you know you, we all have that experience when you know you're s successful the woods everything just goes dead silent you know there's nothing moving nothing happens it's kind of like an airy feeling yeah. to a certain degree you know yeah. so i just waited and i waited and i waited i waited a half hour 45 minutes you know and i said oh there's nothing going on i mean i gotta go for it <clears throat> So I load another arrow, and I ran up there as fast as I could. I mean, that canola is grabbing air. I mean, I'm losing arrows. My <laughs> pack fell off because it snagged. My hat's gone. And I finally get up to him, and he's, he's still alive. No shit. So what happened is as he went down, my arrow launched right through him and hit the back of his spine and broke his back right there. Hmm. And I finally had to put a another arrow into him. He couldn't move, huh? He but was, he couldn't move. Yeah. He was dead as a doornail right there. Hmm. Yeah. And that was that was exciting. And you know now the fun begins because we had we had uh, it's all our our own thing. So we we packed out right there. You know we packed out the two something miles back to the truck the long way. Awesome. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. But <clears throat> yeah. It's um mule deer hunting is just it's it's crazy it's crazy stuff you know. It's a different just a totally. It's a whole different, different ball game. Animal different terrain different. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a lot of glassing like you said. In the odd is glassing is the is the key because you can see what they're doing you know. You just bet out sometimes like not right out in the open but you used to be looking at a big ridge that's mostly bare because all the stuff's in the draws you know all the cover and then there's a bush and but they'll be on this you know a real big one bedded uh got great footage of it just bedded down in the middle of the ridge a tiny little bush there yeah that's it when we were watching those three bucks marching out of the cornfield and they all worked their way down this one draw one day and we we're like oh you can see it it's like oh there's a big muley bedded there i want to see how he reacts to them walking by because they were walking right by him he didn't give he didn't give a shit they just mm -hmm. they walked right by him he didn't do anything just yeah, just watched them. It's cool to see different reactions like that. I watched a uh, uh, a fisher this year. I was just watching. Uh, there were three does bedded on, under my stand in Massachusetts, and they were right like right on me to the point where I couldn't. I was in my saddle, but I was so afraid to move at all. And they were they were in heat too, and I knew they were in heat. So I was just like, oh my god, I got bait right here. I've got to <laughs> I've, I've got to yeah. I've got to be extremely still because I watched them walk in. 
and then they betted right downwind to me too and i'm just like this is not gonna be good like yeah. they're gonna they didn't they must have smelt me but or they didn't i don't know what happened that day but they were just they watched them 30 yards away and then i see a fisher and i'm watching the fisher and the fisher's going right over towards them I'm like i want to see what they do when this fisher comes up and uh she didn't they didn't do anything either the fisher walked, ran right on a log that um this doe was bedded right behind she didn't pay any mind to the fisher fisher the fisher actually jumped when he he was running down the log saw her he kind of like jumped a little bit then he kept going and what's cool about that as i kept following my eyes with that fisher he was running up up a ridge and it brought me to some legs i see some legs coming down the ridge deer legs just following that fisher i didn't yeah, yeah. even know that there was yeah. a deer coming down and i'm like oh shit, what yeah. And it was a, it was a buck coming to check those uh those does nice eight point like 110 inch buck that uh I had passed him a bunch of times during the season but it was he he was coming right down marching down the ridge <coughs> to go check on those does he kicked yeah. them up out of their bed and pushed <coughs> the smallest one around got a bunch of good footage of it but yeah I've only seen a few fishers out hunting but I've seen lately have you guys been seeing a lot more bobcats. I haven't seen a ton of them. I haven't. <sighs> no, I I've haven't. Seen, I've been seeing less. The first few years I was hunting around here, they were all over the place, and yeah. I'm seeing less now. For some no, reason. I, I, I usually see them at my way. I, I got a. Well, I tell you what, I got a. He must be 50, 60 pound bobcat, but <laughs> I haven't seen him this year. He's a tank, but I haven't seen any. But yeah, this season there was one time I saw three of them together. Yeah. Usually whenever I see them, it's usually one. Were I think they, I've seen two, maybe a couple times, but there was three of them together. Were they adults or? Was it... No, they were they were fairly juvenile. Yeah. yeah, they weren't that. One of them, like I didn't get a good look at it, but that one may have been bigger, so it might have been, you know, like a mom with a couple. I don't know what you call them, kits maybe. I'm, yeah, I, I think know. so. Yeah, I've seen kits together <clears throat> quite. A, that's the only time I've seen multiple yeah. bobcats together. They're. I mean, they ones. they weren't like they weren't this year's. I mean, like kittens or whatever. They were from last year's. They were yeah. all on the smaller size. That's but, cool. Yeah, that was a cool experience. Neil, you want to tell us the invincible buck story since? It's a crazy three-year story. Uh, well, two year, two year, two but years. Yeah. So, yeah. well, where you got the three from? So it was really the third time was was the charm on it. So yeah. So this buck here, um, two hundred and thirty-two pounds, uh, one hundred and forty-seven inches. Um, so, yeah. So essentially, this buck, uh, kind of the story. The story behind this one takes place over two seasons. Um, and heavy, just a skull first, just a skull plate. He's heavy. Yeah. yeah I mean, he was heavy all around. Giant neck. Um, so last year's was my first encounter with him. I was hunting a spot, um, one of my, one of my rut spots and, uh, this buck on, is that you, Jeff? That's Hal calling me. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so yeah, so, uh, it was, uh, last season on, uh, it was November 3rd was the first time I ever encountered this buck. And I was, uh, sitting in this one area and there was a doe. That she came walking off at a distance, uh, trudging through, and uh, this this buck was dogging her. And there had been another nice ten pointer that had been in this area. And so at first, when I looked out and saw it, like I I thought it might be, I thought it might be that ten pointer that I was after. Yeah. And then I said, no, that that can't be the same buck. And I watched him for a while, and I thought I was rolling and getting footage of him the whole time. And I'm thinking this footage is going to be awesome because the doe she'd go ten yards, she'd stop and look behind her, and then the buck he'd try to catch back up to her and uh come to find out the whole time i wasn't even recording though i had, i don't know if you've ever done it but you turn oh, yeah. the camera on Double and, tap. well i turned the camera on i hit record but i didn't wait like long enough yeah and it it didn't take the record command i'm watching the viewfinder everything unfold and thinking the footage is gonna be awesome and finally the closest that he got was uh, 170 yards and i had the woodman and so i know it can you know it's a great gun it can get out there and shoot some distance but 170 yards is a poke for a muzzle loader and come to find out afterwards i talked to timmy about it as far as the ballistics and he said Uh usually between 160 and 200 yards somewhere in there depending on what you're using for your load it's it's going to hit a wall and it's going to drop off well i think that's what happened for me because this buck he finally came into a spot at 170 yards i even had um like a trigger stick you know the primos shooting sticks yep i had the muzzleloader set on that so i i'm perfectly steady for that long shot (laughs) And uh, I, when I touched it off, I had the crosshairs high on his back, knowing it was probably going to drop a little bit at that far of a shot. He mule kicked, and I'm thinking for sure, it's like when he donkey kicks and jumps, I, I had to wallop him. And so at that point, smoke clears. I look over, and I'm trying to find him, and he's probably standing five yards off to the right. 
And I'm looking at him thinking, all right, he's probably going to fall over and drop, and I'm getting ready to reload and everything. And so when I look back up, I don't see him anymore. So I assume at this point, he's probably just laying down. He's dead somewhere. I can't see him. Well, then finally, it's like I catch a glimpse of him on this little kind of, this little hump that stuck up. And I pulled back up, looked through him through the scope again, and I'm sitting there. Well, do I shoot? Is he wounded? He kept looking like he turned and would lick like on the side of his back. And I said, oh, it's another 170-yard shot. There's some stuff in the way, but if he's still out there, I already shot him once, and I know that it hit him that first shot, so let me get another attempt at him. So I actually fired that second time, and there, there was no way a bullet was getting through. I ended up missing, but he ran off, and that was when I realized I wasn't recording, so I turned the camera on, and I have footage at that point of him walking off. Mm-hmm. And so from the footage, it didn't look like he was mortally hit. I ended up getting down and checking it out. And there was only specks of blood. So I assumed that the bullet dropped so much, I just grazed him across the bottom of his belly. Um, I tried to get a dog to come in just to check for peace of mind, but it didn't work out. So that was on November 3rd. Had to chalk it up to, hey, I just you know missed on a long shot, but took a chance and took the best shot that I had. So then I think it was four days later, I believe, four or five days later. It might, no, it might have been on November 8th. Um, I went into the same spot, but I decided to sit in a different stand. So I brought my saddle gear in and I moved down along the edge of the swamp and I got set up and I was trying to overlook where I figured this bedding area was. And so I go in with my bow and my muzzle loader. I said, well, if a deer comes by close enough, I'll use my archery tag and save my gun tag for going up north because I wanted to go tracking in the snow. And so luckily there was a little bit of wind. I get the, all the saddle gear set up. I end up at that point uh, hoisting up the muzzleloader and the bow, get the camera set, and right probably with three minutes left to go, everything calms down, the wind stops, and all of a sudden I hear, here comes a deer. It's like I hear the sloshing in the water out in front of me, and it's a doe. She walks by at 25 yards, and I hear the sound that we all want to hear. (laughs) (laughs) And I look up, and there's the same buck. He's coming right on the same line the doe went. He's going to come right by at 25 yards. So of course, well, let's grab the bow. So I go ahead, instead of the muzzle loader, I grab the bow, I get clipped in, and so he comes through the first opening at 25 yards, I go to full draw, camera's in the way. I said, well, I still got a couple more openings. I let down the bow, I move the camera over to the right, wait for him to start coming through the other opening, I'm watching him, this is all recording, I have the footage of this. So then I go ahead and I clip back in, I go to draw again, the camera's in the way again. Well, at this point, I know I can't let down. He's, this is the last window he's going to come through. So I take the cam of the bow, and I push the camera over to the right. And, I mean, perfect window, 25 yards, solid on him, knew that I made a great shot. What I couldn't see is in the swamp at last light, there was a little branch that came up. Yeah. And when it hit that branch, it deflected off, and it gave him a skin across his brisket. Um, so after getting down, pulling the arrow, it was clean, no blood on it. Um, I... I looked at the footage and something just looked off in it. So I went back the next day and I did find hair laying out there. So I was like, wait a minute, I gave him a haircut. What happened? And I zoomed in even closer on the footage. And you can see when that arrow travels, mm-hmm. it's, it's grainy footage because it's at last light. And it's on the low light setting, which it also changes the frame rate. So everything's choppy. But you can see like that branch like explode. And I looked and sure enough, I found... I don't know what you'd call it, but like in the swamp, it's almost like a cedar, like kind of like little just bush that comes up and I hit one of those branches. So, um, I ended up getting a picture of him on trail camera. This is a buck I never knew about any years prior. I run, I run quite a few cameras as most people know. Um, but in this area, I don't, I'd never had a picture of him before. And so I did get a picture of him afterwards. So I knew he was still alive. Um, the muzzle loader hit didn't do anything. The arrow just, as I said, gave him, you know, a haircut, no blood at all. And so a whole year goes by, uh, I'd gotten a picture of him at the end of October. So I knew he was alive. I knew he was back in this area. And I'd been after another buck that I'd talked to you a couple times on the phone about, Jeff. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was a buck that, uh, nickname is Winston. Uh, he's another 10 pointer, probably 160 inches. He's an absolute beauty. And I'd been after that buck cause I've had some history with him. And, uh, so that was what on november 1st i think i spoke with you and rick yeah i gotta say something about that rick and i were laughing our ass off (laughs) because this is all going down and he's texting me and he's texting rick he's going back and forth what do you think (laughs) and i'm 
Then I finally got a hold of Rick and said, hey, did Neil call you? He goes, yeah, he called me. <laughs> and we're kind of laughing because he's so excited, you know. It's mm -hmm. like, it was like awesome. We're kind of, yeah. And we're trying not, trying not to give him advice, but he's looking for advice, but we don't want to give it to him because he knows what he's doing, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we just kind of, kind of made up. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was it was pretty cool. It was the whole thing, how it transpired was like. Well, because then it was cool because that was the first time, like I spoke with Rick to hear about his main buck. Yeah. And then you just got in your buck in Illinois, right? Yeah. yeah. So we had a three-way call on the ride over. Yeah. And of course, I'm sitting there itching though. It's like to ask, yeah, like, yeah, hey, was... it's like, am I stupid for for this is this is a different buck and kind of different story. But uh, so I'm listening to them tell their stories. Yeah. I get parked and I don't have a lot of service where I park. And uh, so this other buck that I was after on November 1st, where it plays in the story is that I knew to get this buck, I probably wasn't going to have a shot where, where I thought he was going to be with a bow. I pretty much knew that I had to use my gun tag in New Hampshire. Okay, and you wanted to save that for tracking. At a well, If you could. Well, the, the year before I wanted to, this year, oh, yeah, okay. this year I had said with my goals, because I set goals for every season, yep. Yep. Um, as much as I wanted to track one in New Hampshire, my goal was to kill that n my number one target buck that I called Winston. My original goal was to kill him however I could. It didn't matter if it was a bow, it didn't matter if it was a muzzle loader, and I knew that probably the first week of November would be the best chance at him, but everything changed this year. He hadn't been in this one area usually in October. He was there all October. I had just, you know, with, at the time, it's like I didn't have a job, so I wasn't working. Um, so you'd think I have all kinds of time to hunt, but I was home with my daughter. Mm -hmm. I was picking up odd jobs. And, of course, it coincided that every time I wanted to go hunting because I knew the weather was perfect and he'd be moving during daylight, that was when I could pick up work to, you know, to make a little bit extra money. So things weren't lining up and things weren't happening. <laughs> but I knew on, on November 1st that that buck it would be in this bedding area. I just, he had... I had pictures of him on cameras leading up to, to that day. And so I knew this is the one spot of all the puzzle where he hasn't been. So I said, he's going to be in there. Um, so I went there driving over there on November 1st, talking to Jeff and Rick saying, Hey, am I, <laughs> am I stupid? It's like, because I want to get this buck. Yeah. It's like the invincible buck. And I said, I, I can't get him with a bow. So if I go in there and I use my muzzle loader on this deer tonight, I'm not going to have my gun tag anymore, so I'm only going to get one of the two. And I want to try to get both bucks. And, of course, I distinctly remember Jeff saying, wait a minute, you have a chance at a 160-inch deer in New Hampshire? <laughs> like, you're stupid for not bringing your muzzle loader." He's like, why would you even consider that? I said, well, because I want to get both of them. I want to get, you know, 100 and, you know, at the time, I figured he was right around 150 inches maybe. Um, I said, I didn't call you stupid. I said, you're crazy, <laughs> man. Yeah. You're crazy, dude. <laughs> yeah. So, so then at that point though, as, as Jeff said earlier, my mind was kind of made up. It's, I said, look, I'm probably gonna regret this later. Um, but I left my muzzle loader sitting in the truck and I grabbed the bow instead. And so I walked in, I got set up two 30 in the afternoon as I'm getting set up. I just get the saddle hung. My backpack still sitting there like on my carabiner from my, my, uh, my bridge in front of me. And sure enough, I look up and I see the bushes moving, pull up my binoculars and look, and there's Winston, 35 yards away, in the mountain laurel, watching him for 20 minutes. And with a muzzle loader, I could have gotten a, a good neck shot yeah, at him. Yeah. Um, but there was no way I was getting an arrow through. And so, of course, after that evening, I'm kicking myself in the ass because, you know, if I had brought the muzzle loader, I would have had him. Um, but then November 3rd came around. And I said, well, it was exactly one year to the day from where I first saw this buck. Yep. And annual patterns are something that I've learned you can't ignore. Yeah. I mean, they're usually in the same spot a year later. The year before, the, the lucky buck, um, that was a similar situation where that buck, exactly 365 days to the year, I got the buck in the same spot. We just talked about this with Steve Shirk on the podcast, too, that I just put out with him. Yep. He had, last year, he there's this buck that every year, the first day of gun season, he makes a long move. He he vacates where he was. Just switches and he moves up to him and he goes to the same spot every year on the first day of gun season. Yep. yep. You gotta you gotta pay attention to that. Yeah, so I mean so I mean as much as, you know, I wanted to, you know, still keep hunting after my number one heart, I said, Look, I said I'd be stupid to not be sitting there um, you know, exactly one year to the day. So sure enough I went into this spot and uh, you know, I I went in there with a the muzzle loader. Um, a lot of times I like to bring both that time of year. It's like when you have the option, but I left the bow, you know, didn't even think about bringing it. So I walked into the spot and I get in there probably about 45 minutes before it gets light out. And as I walk in towards the stand, 
um, there was a deer that took off and it was near where the stand was probably 30, 40 yards away and it trotted off to the left. Well, it didn't sound like it spooked. It didn't blow. It, you know, wasn't really too alarmed because it was still plenty dark and I get climbed up in the stand and I get all the camera gear set up and I'm just sitting there listening. Well, every once in a while I'd hear like a little rustle or what sounded like a footstep of a deer. Every once in a while I'd hear like a branch break. And I said, there's got to be something behind me because I'm where I'm looking out in front. Um, there's this knoll behind me. And so I waited for it to get light enough out. And finally it's like, it goes ahead and, and it gets light and I'm looking out in front and I'm not really, you know, seeing anything going on. So I said, what was that behind me? So I start scooting around to look behind me and I have the camera off to my right. And where I'm looking behind, I glance back there and I said, no, I don't, I don't really see anything. So I go back and I'm still looking in front of me and then I heard something. So now I turn back around, I look and sure enough, about 75 yards away up on a knoll, right at eye level, I look up and there's a big deer standing there. So I'm on my seat. It's like I'm, I'm in a hang on stand. I get turned all the way around to where my butt cheek is barely sitting on the stand anymore. Yeah, it's off yeah. my right hand side yeah. and I'm looking at my binoculars back behind me like this. And I look at, and all I see distinctly, I mean, I see him, he's facing, it's like to the left. I just see it's like that, that fork Crap at the end of the main the beam. Yep. And without a doubt, I said, that's him. That's the invincible buck. So I put the binoculars down and I went to, to I, well, I turn around, I grabbed the gun. I had it like up on a sling on a hanger. So I grabbed the muzzle loader. I get turned back around, still butt cheek, only on by like a fraction on that seat cushion. And uh, so I start looking through the scope when, when I looked at him. He's doing kind of like the head pick up and down because he sees something going on, but he can't tell exactly what I am. And he didn't look like he was going to take off. I mean, he didn't, you know, even though he's doing the head juke, I said, I got to turn the camera on. I haven't even gotten the camera rolling yet. So I reach my hand away to go turn on the camera. And as soon as I get on my Canon camera to turn on the power button, all of a sudden it's like he's head juking even more. And I'm like, he's going to take off. Yeah. So I knew I didn't have time to even try to get the camera rolling. I just instantly put my head back to the scope and when i came back to the scope he took one big lunge step forward when we took that big step forward it just so happened that i mean the trigicon scope that i have there's that green dot in the center yeah and it just instantly was right behind his shoulder right where it needed to be and it was just an instinct reaction i didn't even think to myself pull the trigger it was just the gun went off at, at that point yeah. and i knew it's like I, I hit him right perfect right where it needed to but i it just everything lined up in that exact moment when he took that step that it just stepped right into the crosshairs as he's about ready to bolt so smoke goes everywhere i look and of course you know i i don't see what happened i can't see where he is he's not there anymore so another cool part about you know being a part of the team is we all you know get in get in touch with each other and we we share in the celebration so um uh, chris dalty he had gone and, and already messaged me that morning and wished me good luck and said, hey, you know, if, if you end up getting the Invincible buck, let me know. Uh, so I ended up calling up Chris because he was with his son, Sam. Yeah. And uh, so when I got down and walked over to look, I was actually FaceTiming uh, with, with, with Sam and Chris on the phone. I'm looking for blood. And uh, so, then, um, so then I didn't find any blood at first. I walked down further where I thought that he ran off and um, – didn't see anything, hunt around for 10 minutes. I haven't gotten worried yet, but I'm like, what's going on? How come I haven't found any blood? I went back to where he was standing and I walked in just a little bit further and I said, what are the odds that when I fired, he didn't run the direction he was facing? Maybe he got spun around yep. and I started going off to the right and that's where I found the first spot of blood and I looked up and there he was probably 70 yards away and oh. it was it was quite the sight. I mean, you see a 230 pound you know buck just laying there, that white belly Dude. massive swelled up neck yeah. and yeah, yeah. that rack yeah. especially up. the invincible buck because you were probably yeah. thinking to yourself uh, did he shed this one off again or? i mean i didn't have any doubts but it, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you would you would think it's a possibility so yeah, i mean i i knew it's like i had to hit him pretty good um when you see it like that on the ground that's impressive yeah exactly oh yeah you know yeah i mean i i could see it from 70 yards away it looked yeah. nice and so then I walked up, you know, it's, uh, I mean, so when, that's actually when I FaceTimed, you know, Chris and Sam was when I knew he was dead at that point. So I got to walk up, walk up on him, FaceTiming. And then also, too, it's like called Rick. And because, uh, of course, we have the buck pool. So, of course, with the buck pool, Rick was leading it at that point. Um, and so I had to call him up and be like, oh, I, I think I think I took the lead from in, in the buck pool. It's because we go by. Uh, yeah, I forgot Rick. you guys are doing that. Yeah, the weight plus the score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the weight plus the score. So. So at that point, it was the bar was set pretty high, and um, that other buck and what did you score again? 
Uh, so it was 147. 147. Wow. Yep. 230. Two? Yeah, two hundred and thirty two point four officially. Wow, yep. That's a great one. Yep. So it has that was, everything. Oh. Yep. But uh so then after that, unfortunately, I mean, as much as I don't want to take away from the celebration of the Invincible Buck, that other buck that I'd been after. I was gonna say, what the heck happened to Winston, dude? He completely disappeared. Um so that first week in November, after November first, he was never there again in the spot where he'd always been the first week in November. And I thought, you know, maybe he got hit by a car, maybe another hunter got him. You'd think you'd hear about a deer of that caliber being taken in the area. And then finally I did get a picture of him at the end of the season with a couple days left. So, oh, good. So, so he's still around. So he's around. I don't know why it's like, I mean, you never know why patterns change and things shift. Mm. And, you know, it's like deer go to different areas and stuff. But, yeah, he was in a different area. He's he's an old deer. So I'm hoping, hoping he'll be around next year. And next year will be the story of Winston, hopefully. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. And hopefully he's still uh 160-ish. Yeah, I have a feeling. I mean, he well, so he, he had been a 10-pointer this year, and last year he started to grow like a little bit of an 11th point. This year he had a solid 11th point. There was even the start of a little nub of, of a 12th. Yeah, so it might so. be a 6x6 six six next year. He, Good one. Yeah, he could be real special next year. So Nice. How yep. old do you think he is? I don't know. I mean, I look back, the first pictures, uh, you're talking Winston? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the first pictures that I think I have of him are back in 2019, and back then he's 140-inch 10-pointer, oh. so... I mean, you would think, you know, that, nine. yeah, I mean, you think at that point he's at least three and a half at absolute minimum, but oh. probably more likely four and a half back in 2019. Hmm. So what were your goals again this year? I know I watched the video and your video was awesome, um, yep. but what were the goals and which ones did you get and not get? Obviously yeah. you did get the Winston one. Yeah. So that was, that was, you know, one of my goals that I really wanted to, you know, focus on that and, um, this year I kind of set a little bit different goals um, because, you know, being a father, you know, with, with a daughter and everything now. And I had said, I've always, like we talked about earlier, I've always hunted hard. I've always tried to hunt whenever I can as much as I can. And so this year I wanted to try to focus on hunting less but having higher percentage of either sightings mm-hmm. or success. Um, so I really, my goal was, as weird as it sounds, to not hunt as much. Yeah. Um, and so I... I, I know it sounds weird, and but it's okay. It's okay yeah. to have that goal, especially... Yeah. You know, when things change, man, you got little ones, you yep. have to have, yeah, you almost have to have that goal. Yeah. So, th- I mean, that was, that was really my number one goal was to not hunt as much and try to, you know, capitalize on the opportunities that, it, of when I did hunt. And I mean, I, I do feel like, yeah, it's like the times that I did hunt, I was in the game. Um, and then, you know, really from there, other than Winston, um, it was more, I wanted to go back to the Adirondacks again. I didn't know if things were going to play out to be able to go there. Um, so that was just a goal of mine to go hunt in the Adirondacks. And then, then from there, it was really, you know, up in Maine tracking down a buck. I mean, that's always kind of a goal of mine, but I wanted to, you know, spend some time up there. Um, I really wanted to try to, you know, hunt with my dad more this year and try to get some footage of him and filming, filming with him. That just didn't really work out this year. Um, but yeah, I mean, my goals, as I said, were, were a little bit different. It wasn't focused on necessarily a particular deer, you know, a certain caliber or size of deer. Um, it was really more just about kind of, you know, it's, I think, focusing my efforts in a different way. So, <clears throat> yep. Um, yeah, and then the one, there was another goal is actually I wanted to go and get a, a buck with a bow in Massachusetts because I haven't done that yet. Um, and so with that goal, things changed throughout the season just because I wasn't, you know, seeing the bucks that I wanted to on camera in Mass. Yep. So I focused more in other areas. But so some of the goals that I set, they just didn't work out. And, I know I've gotten great feedback from talking to people who watch the video and film how, you know, the setting goals piece really inspired them to write those goals down and share those goals. And a couple people have asked, you know, about like, you know, it's, hey, it's like, well, do you really just make sure you focus and stick to those goals and, and <laughs> yeah. go all in? And I mean, yeah, you try to, but you got to change. I mean, you have to necessarily, if things aren't working out or for whatever reasons or situations come up, you got to adjust on the fly as well. Yeah. Goals aren't always, you're not always going to hit your goals, man. Goals are just a benchmark for you to, to strive for. But, you know, you yeah. never you would never get there if you didn't actually have it set. So the way that you do it is, is great advice for, for hunters who are looking to yeah. be successful. It's just set a goal. It doesn't have to be a yeah. giant buck. It could be to shoot a four-pointer this year. And just set your goal. And then, like, the scenario that, that I kind of, you know, talk about a lot, you know, in some of the seminars and expos that I do and questions that I get from guys is, like, the problem they have, especially when it comes to tracking, is, one, most people don't live where there's snow. Most people aren't fortunate to be, yep. you know, 
Exactly. Ha- Hal Blood, it's like, the, you know, you just walk right out your backyard and you have great snow conditions. I mean, hopefully. Um, but, you know, down here, we have to travel to places. So we have to make trips. Mm. And so I think for a lot of people, that's a huge obstacle or hurdle is to think about traveling to where there's snow, especially if you have target bucks around where you live. Yeah. When it gets to the, the heat of the season and you've already put in time, you've already been grinding, you don't want to have to just hop in the truck and drive and you're like, well, wait a minute, tonight could finally be the night. Mm-hmm. And if you have a goal that's already set, you've already predetermined what you're going to do. So then you just you just do it. Like if you said, hey, like when there's snow, I'm going to chase it. I'm going to hop my truck and go. It doesn't matter what else is going on. That decision, like if that target buck walked by your camera that night and you're kicking yourself in the ass, well, hey, it's because I already had a goal. I already made that decision ahead of time. And you just got to kind of stick to it. But um, I think it helps to focus your efforts. I mean, coming from a fitness background, that's a huge part of it. Is you have to have the game plan. You have to focus your efforts and energy on what you want to accomplish and do the work to, to make it succeed. Yep. 100%. But, yeah. So, yeah, so that, that started off the season. It was a three-buck season for me. So I got that buck in New Hampshire. Um, then up in Maine, I uh, spent some time up there tracking. Um, it was I went up there with the Henry. I was up there hunting. Uh, for the last week of rifle season in Maine and had a couple of opportunities. Actually, once before that, I went up and I hunted uh, up in Jackman, Maine uh, for the first time up in that area, stayed at Lake Parlin Lodge. That was awesome, by the way. I, have, you, have you stayed there to go hunting? Oh, yeah. I, oh, no, I've never I never stayed at Lake Parlin. I usually, um, we did a lot of tent hunting yeah. up uh, on the other side of the Golden Road, so... Uh, I'd never been to, Joe always wanted me to go there. Yeah. But... I mean, I thought it was great. I mean, obviously the food up there, it's like every night. Oh, it's night, a fantastic place. You got dinner, you wake up in the morning, breakfast was at 4.30 every morning. Yeah. Well, just and, a dream, huh? Well, then, of course, you got all the sandwiches pre-made and baggies because, you, know, you know, I'm used to packing. I bring all the stuff that you have to think about making your sandwiches for the next day. Of course, I get there and everything's already ready to go and sandwiches made, cookies are ready, bags of chips if you want them, Gatorade, water. I thought you waters. said you were hardcore. <laughs> well, that, what I'm getting at though, it was nice to finally go someplace. You don't have to worry about oh, that yeah. stuff, right? You can just go out and hunt, and oh, food's yeah. already thought of. You don't have to worry about cooking and grabbing stuff or or any of that. And I, uh, I don't have time for that stuff. I'm like a bear in the dump. I just stop packing stuff in my sack, <laughs> yeah. and I'm gone. <laughs> but, so yeah, so then uh, I went to a spot actually that uh, that Joe Cruzy he had mentioned, and there wasn't great snow conditions, uh, kind of you know, I guess the further south. So I had to head up more towards the Canadian border. I tried it that morning, but by 10 o'clock, the snow was gone. Everything had melted. Really? And so when I started driving north, you could look off in the distance and see, you know, white white tops of mountains. Yeah. So I said, yeah, that's that's where I got to go. Yeah, that'll do. And, I mean, advice for anyone, you know, it's like don't kind of give up halfway through the day. I know sometimes a lot of people, well, what are the odds that, you know, I'm going to cut a track and make something happen with only, you know, a couple hours left in the day, but... I didn't get out of my truck until I think it was like 1.30, and I was itching to get in the woods. I turned on, you know, one of the popular roads up up in that area. I'm not going to name any particular road, <laughs> but there's a few of them that people hear on the podcast, and I happened to turn on to one of those roads, and uh, the first turn off that I came to, th- there was a pull-off there. Nobody had pulled into it, and there was a, a blocked-off road that, that went up in, and I said, well, nobody's been up in there. You know, there's snow on the ground at this point. There's a couple inches of snow, and... I parked my truck, get grabbed all my gear, headed out. It's one thirty, so I got you know a few hours left for the day, and just as I got past where the blocked off road was, I could see there was a doe and a fawn track. They had come down like that logging road, and they had cut off and gone into the woods, and so I walked up further past them. Then I saw a medium sized buck track. He had come down. He had cut off the same way the doe and the fawn went. Then I went a little bit further and I found a track that looked like it was pretty good size. I couldn't tell because it was snowed in and it was older exactly. It looked like, you know, it could be one of those minimum 170, 180 pound buck. Could be 200, but I need to see it get freshened up. Had a good stride uh, to it. So I followed it for only, we're talking 150, 200 yards. It looked like it was feeding on some raspberry tops and whatnot. And uh, then it took a hard turn out of where it was feeding and just started kind of beelining it towards this kind of like hill area off in the distance and uh, then all of a sudden i've only gone maybe 300 yards from where i left that logging road and it freshened right up it didn't look smoking fresh but it went from looking like it was made that morning to i'm probably an hour two hours behind this thing 
And at that point, I said, he's probably right here somewhere. I put on the brakes. And after that feeding, I said, he's probably laid down. He fed there, you know, meandered around, freshened up. He's got to be right here somewhere. Sure enough, I take one more step. Up pops this buck. He's probably 60 yards away, looking at me head on. And I get the GoPro rolling. I have the footage of it and everything. And I'm pulling up and looking at him through the scope, trying to figure out what I want to do. But I had too much time to think about it, and it was too easy. It's like I'm 10 minutes from my truck at this point, probably. And I'm looking at him thinking, yeah, he's a nice buck. He has, you know, you know, a, you know, a good frame, but he didn't have that massive box chest and huge neck and just, you know, those heavy horns. And I kept thinking, oh, should I, should I pull the trigger on him or not? It would be cool. It's like, you know, up at Lake Parlin Lodge, all the guys are there. It's like the clients are there. And first day hunting up there, it would be great to, you know, bring one back and put it on the game pole. But I said, ah, oh, I like to spend some time hunting in Maine and I've gotten a lot of nice bucks. So I said, no, nah. I said, it's one of those that I don't think it's definitely over 200. Well, after I looked at the GoPro footage and saw him running off, <laughs> the rack that it had, again, it wasn't, you know, a huge rack, but it was long beams, you know, you know, big hoops on it and it had a tall G2s on it. It was still kind of a blurry image, but I said, yeah, I probably should have shot that one. What's uh, that old saying? Never pass up something the first day you wouldn't shoot the last day? Yeah. Yeah. So, How long were you up there? How many days did you have the hunt? Uh, that was just two days. So I went up for Friday and Friday and Saturday. Um, yep. So spent the two days up there. That was, you know, the, the best opportunity um, that I had. I tracked a giant on Saturday. That was a massive, massive track when I came into that one. But that was right at the end of the day and just didn't have enough daylight to even try to think about catching him. Um, so that was my first trip up there. Great area. All kinds of deer. And then, so I went to Western Maine, hunted over there the last week of, uh, of rifle. And then I was planning on staying for the week of, of muzzleloader too. Um, so actually, sorry, I went up there the last few days. So I went up there after Thanksgiving dinner with the family, I headed up and I uh, hunted Friday and Saturday with, with the Henry. And I did have a buck that I couldn't quite tell it was 150 yards at the end of one of the days up at the top of these cuts. And I looked up, saw it was a big body deer, but I couldn't confirm that it, what it had for a rack on it. Um, I have a, one of the Skinner scopes that, that's on the gun. For the money, unbelievable scope. I mean, it, it's a great, you know, six power scope on it, red dot. Um, I mean, super clear, love it, but it's not a high end scope. It's not what Andy markets it, it as. It is for the money, amazing. You know, it's, it's under 300 bucks, um, but that far, that distance, I wanted a little bit more magnification and of course, when you're looking uphill at a deer, looking at you head on, yeah, it's it's hard to see when you have a backdrop yeah. and there wasn't snow on the trees or anything to see what it was. And it was a three minute standoff where I'm watching this deer look down at me, and I kept putting my hands down in my like hand warmer like uh, like the muff thing, yeah, because um, my my hands were getting pretty cold. And I'd pull back up and look at him, and finally when he went to take off and he turned his head sideways, I could see he had long beams and short tines. But I walked up and saw the track, and yeah, that was a probably two hundred pound buck. And... <laughs> do you uh, do you carry uh, binoculars with you? Uh, not when I mean not when I'm gun hunting or tracking, because yeah. I'm used to you know having usually it's like a, a three by nine scopes so that nine power. Yeah, I can see what I need to and pull up and look through that. Yeah, um, and I'd always hate to, I'd hate to pull the binoculars up when I could have pulled the gun up, and then by the time sure. you get the gun yeah, up, I have that buck take off. So yeah um yeah everything tracking is jump shooting anyways 90 percent of the time but i mean i I, i've actually had had the different different experience than that i mean for me i don't know what it is i usually whether whether i'm better at seeing them further off or i just suck at sneaking up on them i don't know (laughs) which it is but for me it's like it's usually i mean i've only had a couple of tracking encounters where i've gotten within that 50 60 yard window usually it's 80 to to i mean i've had shots over 100 yards tracking Yeah, I always bring binoculars no matter where I go, what I do. Yeah. Because you can kind of scan if you're into that that last that last bit of the home run stage, yep. you know. Then you can scan out in front of you, you know, try to pick them up. Anything horizontal, side cover or whatever. Yeah, because especially if especially yeah. if you've already jumped them once, mm-hmm. they're not going to be usually standing right out in the open. They're going to run to you know it's like the cover on the opposite side of me standing yeah. there looking back at you yeah. um waiting for you to come across the open yeah and so yeah so then um then uh, that monday of muzzle loader um that day it was it was actually raining out it was raining all night long but we had had a 
good amount of snow on the ground. And so when I woke up that morning, I had had high hopes that if I drove, you know, a little bit further north, I was going to end up hitting snow. And uh, when I ended up driving up the road, I went up a few miles and it switched over from where it had been all rain into slush. So you could see it's like where overnight it had been snowing, but then the rain had turned it over in the road. And uh, there was one guy that was in front of me driving down the main road and he had turned off on one of the lefts. And so I knew past that any logging road that I hit, it was going to be, you know, fresh and virgin, virgin snow. Nobody had driven up in these roads. So I took the next right and it was a long road that went up in. And uh, I drove up in, I came to one buck track that I looked at it and said, it's close to 200. I said, I don't know if this is the one that I want to go on. So I said, ah, it's fresh. I mean, the way it's raining out, I know it wasn't made too long ago. So I drove further up the road. And of course, the further you get from one of those tracks that you're debating whether or not taking, yeah. you're worried if somebody's going to be behind me. Yeah. Well, yeah. You're gonna, I'm worried somebody's going to be behind me. So somebody at that point is going to end up taking that track. And I don't know what I'm going to find up in front of me. Yeah especially if it's been raining, they could be laid down. I don't know exactly what's happening. Um, so I went up a little bit further though. And then I found a, 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 what looked to be like a better buck track. Um, he was with a doe. And so this is still 45 minutes before it gets light out. So I pulled the truck over on the side of the road and just sat and waited. And of course that sucks. I'm chomping at the bit to get out. And you know, it's like, I want to just, you know, get on the track and start going, mm-hmm. but got all my gear situated, knew I was going to get soaked to the bone that day. And so I hopped on that track and that was, that was a big track. He was one that the track looked like it was, you know, a 220 pound buck. And he had, I mean, a, a wide, a wide stance. He had, you know, a nice long stride to him. And every time he came to anything with that doe that she would walk between some trees or even she would step over a blow down tree, he would just go right out around it. So every time I saw that, and it was probably a dozen, 15 times. It's just, I kept, you know, picturing that rack, giant rack. Yeah, uh, rack yes, I just, I'm... And, and I knew it's like that just with the way the conditions were, it's like that. I mean, I was going to sneak right up on him. I just said, this is, this is a, this is a killing day. It was perfect conditions. So after about a mile, I started coming back up towards the road that I'd driven down. And of course, guess where I came out on the road, right, at, right at the track that I drove yeah, over. The first one. Yeah. It was actually him. He had, he had oh. literally probably just crossed minutes before, before I came across oh. Oh. and it was actually it's just with the way he went across his track didn't look as big mm-hmm. and he was actually stepping in the doe's track so i didn't see a buck and a doe until i got up on the bank and then of course they they split back up but of course i'm thinking well if only i'd parked here he'd already be dead probably by now i'd be yeah i'd be hauling him out so and i nobody had picked up that track after you went through huh? no still nobody had driven in at that point so I went up in a couple hundred yards and uh there was a couple times he looked like he was going to leave the doe and they would make, you know, hard turns and it looked like they were even feeding in a couple of spots. So I thought at any point they, they might, you know, bed down. The woods were perfect. I mean, the woods with all that rain, you could see through them. They were open woods, but had just enough cover that were these little teeny like bumps that would come up. Yep. And so you could see for about 80 yards, but you couldn't see on the other side of that little bump. So you'd walk over to it and you can look back out and scan the next 80 yards and like little patches here and there. But it was all fairly open woods. So I just said, all right, one of these times I'm going to come over one of these rises and you know, I'm just going to look out and there he's going to be standing there. And I started actually smelling him. At this point, I could smell the buck. Like you could smell, you know, that buck musk scent. Yeah. And I was catching big whiffs. So I, I said, look, I, he's got to be right here. So I come down off on those little humps. I do a quick scan. Don't see anything. I start walking down. I come to like a little wet spot or trickle brook or whatever. All of a sudden I see what looks like to me it, a buck pop up. It looked like, you know, a deer getting out of its bed. And, uh, so at that point I, you know, just see a rat come up and I pull up cause I look, the tracks go right to, I mean, where this deer is. I'm watching these big buck tracks go right to it. And so I see, see the horns. I go ahead and I pull up and, or actually right before I pulled up, I just reached on my shoulder, turn the GoPro on, pull the gun up. The buck's looking at me head on just with that Oh crap! Look on his face, <laughs> and so at that point, just without hesitation, I pulled the trigger and shot, and uh, the buck goes straight down. So I start walking up to the deer, and I'm thinking in my head, "Nice buck." But as I'm saying the words "nice buck," it's dawning on my head like what you saw looking through the scope and what you were following. It doesn't quite add up. Yeah. But it took me a second because it's just I just assumed it had to be you know the, the same buck that I was trailing. And then as I start walking up, the buck jumps back up 
I knew I'd hit him good. It's like, it was, you know, a chest shot. So I put it right into his brisket and with the woodman, I was fairly confident the angle I was going to slip it in, you know, put it right through his boiler room. So he starts to take off. And that's when I realized this definitely <laughs> is not the buck that was going out around every, yeah. every tight spot. Um, so then I see him start going off and then he goes down a couple of times and then he, he fell down as I'm reloading and I could tell he wasn't going to get back up. So I walk over to him and, you know, I check him out and of course I'm happy, you know, it's like, you know, mission accomplished. I, I got one tracking, but it just, it ate at me. What the hell happened? Mm. And so I said, well, the story's in the snow, right? So I, I look and well, here's, you know, you can see a set of tracks that go up, but he's been stepping in the tracks. So he's coming down. I said, well, let me just walk up further and see what happened. So I went probably 200 yards up further. I think I measured it on Onyx from where that buck was that I shot. Um, it was 230 yards further up that that's where that buck was that I was tracking when I fired because he actually took off jogging. Was he bedded there? So what had happened was is so I was, you know, a couple hundred yards, you know, behind the buck and the doe. They came up to this one spot where there was like this um, – there was a, a bank that dropped down to this brook. There was a steep kind of cut coming off the side of this mountain where the brook was down this like big ditch. And at the top of that ditch, the buck and the doe had actually split up. And there was, you know, when I say split up, they'd probably separated by 10, 15 yards. And he started walking a little bit up higher. And she stayed down on the top of that bank of the brook. And he's, you know, looking at her. Well, now the buck that I shot, this little guy, he comes walking up the bank and he comes in the equation. Well, that big buck, I'm assuming, probably just looked at him and said, what are you doing here? That, yeah. That's my doe. So he puts his head down. He starts walking down you know, their tracks. And so when he walked into me and I walked into him, his head was down. He's smelling the doe still. He's thinking, man, I wish I could turn around and, you know, and hang out with her. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's like, why is he still smelling her? But, yeah. yeah, so what I saw was when he picked his head up because his head had been down sniffing the track. It looked to me like something stood up, but it was just him picking his head up. And so then when I fired, that buck and the doe were still up there. They hadn't they hadn't moved anywhere yet because it had only been, you know, probably like a minute or, yeah. or two difference. And so when I fired, that buck, it startled him, and he jogged for about 80 yards, headed up like along, along the brook. The doe took off, and she went across the brook, and she kept going. And so, of course, at that point, I, I there was a there was a buddy that he had said he might he might come over and meet up with me that day. Um, so I had said, well, if he's coming, I want to try to get in touch with him because I want to see if I can put him on this track. Yeah. And of course, usually don't have service when when you need it. Mm. So um, so I trekked fur, further up the mountain to try to see if I could get service. Finally, I got service, and he said, yeah, he said I'm I'm not gonna be able to you know make it over there. I got a buddy coming over to do some work on the house. Um, so, so then I said, well, I said, oh, I said, I, I wanted to catch a glimpse at that, at that buck, but I said, I, I got, I got my dead buck back there. I got to get back to him. Um, so I walked on the other side of the brook and just came out to see if they were standing over there. And, and as much as I wanted to keep following him, just cause I wanted to catch a glimpse to see what he had for headgear. It's yeah. like, I knew that, yeah, I said, I got to head, head back to that buck. So I went back to that buck and, you know, made the, the after, you know, kind of footage and stuff, you know, at the deer and, um, and the funny, the funny story was, is that guy that when I was driving in the truck that was in front of me that made a left-hand turn, yeah. I had met him a couple days before and we had a real great conversation. Well, as I'm, as I'm walking out back to my truck, who comes driving down the road? It's, it's that same guy. And so we got talking for a while and I said, that must've been you that turned off on that road. And he said, yeah, it was me. And I said, have you found anything good? No, I haven't found a good enough track to follow. I said, you well, gave, guess what? You gave him the intel. I said, I know there's a track for you to follow, and so I brought him up in there and put him on that track. And um, I was really hoping that it was going to work out for him, but he never caught up with it. He never caught up with that buck that day. But hmm. it was still, it was you know, cool experience. You know, great day. And um, even when I was out on that road, there was a guy that he came. He came up um, the road. He had a wicked cool rig. He had uh, a truck with uh, dually tires in the back with an in bed camper in it. And uh, we talked for quite a while, and he had run cameras in that area. And so uh, he, I think he had heard me shoot, so he actually asked, well, which one did you shoot? And I said, not the one that I wanted to. And I, I described the buck to him, and he goes, oh, is it this one? He pulls out his phone and actually shows me a picture. No way. So you did get to see him. Uh, well, of the buck that I had shot. Oh, yeah. And then he said, well, which one were you following? He said, because I saw down, down the road, it's like you know where you had gone and crossed, and the one that you shot isn't the one that you were on. And I said, I said, 
never got to see him, so I don't know which one it was. He said, well, there was two nice 10-pointers that, that, that were in here. I said, really? And I said, yeah. He said, uh, I said, well, have you ever seen their tracks? I know you run the cameras, but do you see their tracks in the snow? Yeah. And I said, how big of a hoof did it have on it? He said, well, there's one in here that has a gigantic hoof. I said, no, it's not that one. I said, this was a good hoof, but it wasn't one of those 250-plus hoofs. And uh, he said, yeah. I said, no, that other one, he's he's a nice 10-pointer, and he probably was, I mean, 150-inch, you know, nice nice tines. But that other one, holy shit. I mean, that other buck. not the heavy one? Yeah. That one was just massive, everything you'd, you'd want. I mean, Ooh. you know, thick, heavy horns, tall tines. That was a giant. And, hmm. I mean, that's not the one that I saw, but – or the one that I was following, I mean, but yeah, yeah. but you got a place to go start next year when the snow yeah, flies sure. if you want to. Then yeah. yeah, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's always so many great spots, and that's the thing about Maine. It's just you know, I mean, you talk to guys, and it's cool to go back to you know the same area, but it's almost not quite the same. It's yeah, I like to go someplace new and just you know see scenery that you had never seen before, and mm-hmm. just just roam. That's yeah. the cool part about trekking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and traveling and hunting in general, like we were talking about. Oh, well then, so speaking of that, yeah. we have uh, the, the, the kind of cool story about the Adirondack hunt. Yeah. Yeah, because you play a part in that, actually. Yeah, it's a guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a guess. I mean, I, so, I mean, I probably wouldn't have ended up. part, yeah. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have ended up there if it wasn't for, for Pat and Onyx. Um, but, yeah, so one of my goals was to hunt the Adirondacks. So, uh, so once it was later in the season, there was a couple days left in the Adirondack season. There was snow in the forecast. So I said, hey, time to hop in the truck and drive out there. And the year before, I'd done the same thing. And the first day out there, I'd gotten a buck. Um, so this year, I dropped him, hopped in my truck, and I started driving at 5 o'clock in the morning. It took me five hours to get there. Um, <laughs> I stopped at one of the town offices to buy my license because it listed I listed through the, you know, new york.gov that they sold licenses there the town clerk was gone for the day <laughs> so uh so that so there was nobody there that could sell the licenses so of course they're like well you can go to the next town up and they'll hopefully sell a license there so i show up at the town office and it's actually cool that i get the footage of it on, on the gopro i go in buy my license and i didn't want to drive five hours out to new york in my woolies yeah so i asked it said hey i said uh <laughs> can i get changed anywhere in here Oh, we got a great restroom right over there in the hall. So right in the restroom of the lobby of the town office in, in New York, I brought my hunting clothes in, changed my woolies, <laughs> awesome. put my boots on, get suited up, walk outside, and it was flurrying snow at that point. Perfect. And uh, so I needed to figure out a spot to go. And luckily, because I talked to you on the ride out, I you know said the town where I was, near where I was going to be hunting. And uh, then uh, you had sent a pin last year because we talked about the Adirondacks. And I, how, how come you picked that spot, I guess? It was just a super unique terrain feature. And I was just, you know, you can get a, you can get all of a sudden in map mode and you're just like looking at maps for a long time. Just cause It can be fun. Yeah. Just yeah. looking at that in the topos. And you could see that terrain feature from zoomed out a long way as I zoomed in. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? It's yeah. just like the perfect funnels and they're like lined up, you know. It just looked cool. And I was like, yeah. that, there's probably going to be scrape or signpost or something in these you know these these axes you could just tell yeah giant big at big ridges everywhere and it's like a crisscross like deer and animals have to be funneling through right there yeah yeah i mean it was, I was like if i ever go out there i want to get in there but it looked like it was far and hard to get to <laughs> yeah so yeah so like, we, that's a mission for neil not me <laughs> there was too much snow to get into where your pin was that, that's for sure but i had seen that when i looked on onyx for the area and uh so i saw that pin i said well Pat dropped a pin there. I'm 10 minutes down the road from where that pin is. I had also spoken with one of the other team members, Wes Labar, on the ride out. And funny enough that he had recommended where that pin was. There was, you know, a bunch of mountains right there. Yeah. And one of the mountains that he had said was in that cluster of mountains. Mm-hmm. So, of course, I said, well, I got Wes saying I should go there. I got a pin from Pat. That's cool. So I said, yeah, well, that's where I'm going to pull my truck off the road and go up in. So... Yeah, so I went up in there and um, I headed towards that cluster of mountains and the snow was I mean, fairly deep. It was almost knee deep snow um, down in by the road. So I there was a bunch of fresh tracks, but everything was small. And then when I got to the base of that mountain, that's where I started to see rubs and I saw a couple of buck tracks, um, but nothing that looked like what I wanted to follow. But it still kind of messes with me going to the Adirondacks because the tracks are smaller out there. It's it's not like you know going to Maine or northern New Hampshire where you see those you know. Like Western Mass, same way too. 
Yeah. Well, in Western Mass, you can yeah. still see some of those tracks that like you know look like they could be a two hundred pound buck, um, but there is a lot more smaller ones. Mm. I mean, you could yeah. have a hundred and forty, hundred and fifty pound looking track that has you know a huge set of horns on it. Yeah, they could be. So I hadn't found anything that, that I liked out there. So then, of course, I was determined to try to go for a mission to cut up the mountain to see if I could get into that cluster. And I started up that first mountain. I got to the top, and I said, screw this. I yeah. said, this sucks. I mean, I <laughs> I went probably a mile in, and I was I, mean, I was drenched in sweat at that point. And then I hadn't seen a sign of life, you know, once I started up that mountain. There was, on the front face of it, there was some tracks. But once I got up on top, there was not yeah. a sign of a squirrel up there. And the further I went in, just the more disparaging it got. Mm. So I said, let me drop down back in this valley. So I cut down towards this valley. And when I dropped down into it, I ended up coming out to like this, um, this kind of like swamp, like heath bog. And on the back side of it, I jumped a doe and she took off going back down towards the road. She was all alone. Um, so I started walking back towards the road and I was actually going to loop closer to the road from where that mountain was. Cause that's where all the tracks were. And I said, well, there's gotta be a nice buck in that pocket of deer somewhere. So as I started cutting back down, um, I came out to this, uh, this tote road, and as I walked down the tote road, there was a nice buck track that was in it. It was all snowed in because it had snowed either just before first light or probably at first light. So everything was snowed in like an inch or two of snow. And uh, you could tell he was feeding on the side of this tote road. There was some grass growing there or something, and he would feed on the grass. And so he walked up to one tree, and he made a pretty good rub. You could see the, the shavings from where he'd rubbed that tree up were they were covered with a little bit of snow, but you could see all the fresh shavings just underneath that little, little bit of snow. And so I said, well, I said, he's got to be right here somewhere in this pocket because I came further down. I came in and cut the base of the mountain. So I said, he's still got to be in there. I haven't crossed his track yet. Uh -huh. He was feeding on that grass. I said, I bet he's still laid down here. And at this point, it's, I don't know, noontime, 1230. I've only been in the woods in, you know, hour and a half, maybe two hours at, at, at the most. So I got on his track, and so I went a couple hundred, you know, a few hundred yards. And uh, sure enough, I came down this one little drop, and his track looked like, you know, still fairly old. It looks in front of me like, okay, yep, you know, it goes down in. And there's little bushes there, and I look at the bank up on the other side. As I'm looking up that bank, all of a sudden, boom, he pops up 50 yards in front of me and starts taking off. And uh, he looked, what you know, to be a nice eight-pointer as he was running away. He had a box chest on him. And he came up on that hill and he stopped in all these thick alders. So I couldn't really get a good look at him at that point. But I could see Brown in the scope and I could see I had a shot. And I had uh, with me, I brought the 35 Whalen on, on that hunting trip. I said, well, if anything is going to make it through that shit, it's going to be a 35 Whalen. So I said, well, let me take a chance. I only got a couple days to hunt out there. And I was meeting up with uh, with Rick Labby and Lee Libby. I said, yeah, it'd be cool to get another one on the first day. So I touched it off and I ended up hitting him on that first shot. I had to track him for a ways after that to, to get another another shot into him, but um, eventually caught up with him, and he was a ni nice eight-pointer. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, those are great. I, I saw all those pictures. They're awesome bucks, man. Yep. Yeah. No, that was that was a cool experience, and so, I mean, to be out there then the next day, I got to film Lee, so that was cool, you know, hauling a camera around and hunting with him for a day. Yeah. So I've had – it's been a cool experience the last two seasons. So last year I filmed Rick for a day getting to hunt with him and then this year it was lee following him around for a day yeah that's awesome yeah good stuff oh yeah no it was, it was a great time and then i mean the cool part you know hanging out with those guys and then you know we just got kind of one of those random chances i was telling you earlier um so the next morning when, when we woke up uh we're we had taken the buck out of the truck at night cause of course you want to look at it you know sitting outside where you're hanging out and having a couple of drinks and so uh, we loaded it back on the truck um, and as we're loading the buck up on the truck, there were some guys staying next to us that we knew that were hunting. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden they come out and of course they recognize Rick at first. Rick Labby. And they're like, wait a minute. Is that Lee Libby? And they're like, Oh, Hey, that's Neil. And, uh, so it was, yeah, Dustin Martin with Northwoods Whitetails. And so we, we actually talked to them that morning and, uh, oh. neither, uh, neither Rick or Lee drink coffee. Nope. Yeah. Rick Jake's tea. So I did not know that, but wow. the place that we were staying he doesn't, at, he doesn't eat bread either. Yeah. Who, Rick? Rick, yeah. Yeah. But so that that, that was weird though. I woke up in the morning and I'm thinking we're gonna have coffee because we're gonna go out hunting all day long, and there was no coffee in the place. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm thinking, well, what the hell? This isn't great. And of course, when I saw those guys that were staying there, I said, hey, 
you guys got some coffee? Come on in. So they gave me a cup of That's coffee. That's good. Nice. We exchanged stories. And then, uh, so then that night when we got back from hunting, um, they were outside having a tailgate party. So you could tell something had happened. And Dustin, he got a real nice buck out there. So, Did he? Yeah. yeah. So that was cool to get to hang out with fellow hunters. and Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, small world, especially when you start tracking too, huh? Because you're chasing the snow, coagulates people in the same spots a lot of the time. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. Did well, you get to do much tracking this year? I didn't do any tracking. Um, I uh, I hunted I hunted long the long bow season and then had had that action I was telling you guys about first week of gun season and then uh, we didn't get any snow here and I just didn't I didn't have time to to go travel yep. and chasing anywhere this year. Yeah, there's no snow down here. I was going to come down here. I was waiting for it. Last but... day of the season, there was... There yeah, was the last snow. day. there. Was... I, I went out the last day. It was raining here, though, where yeah. I went. Yeah. Uh, I went to, like, southern southern Mass. It was rainy, rainy, windy day. Yep. I'm sure there was some snow somewhere in that, with that storm coming through. But, mm. yeah, yeah, it was I... the first time I had hunted in this area and not had any snow the whole season. Usually, we at least get a day or two. Yeah. You know, not that I'd be tracking here, but just to enjoy the snow and yeah, a, a yeah. snowy hunt. But we didn't get any of this year here. Yeah, <laughs> even on Western Mass, there really wasn't any snow out there. And I, I kept waiting for it to come in the forecast and didn't happen. But yeah, on the last day of the season, I started off hunting around here. I did an archery hunt. And then uh, there was somebody, it's like he had messaged me saying he was going to go out to Western Mass and go up on top of one of those mountains. And I said, I don't know if, I don't know if there's even going to be snow. I said, yeah. I know there's a chance. And he sent me a picture of some white stuff. And I said, <laughs> yeah i said well i, I love to track okay. so I, I so i after i got out of the woods i sent it and drove two and a half hours to western mass and then i was on snow for the, for the last few hours of the day so last like, year was really good snow yeah, yeah. yeah. i got in yeah. the uh, moose out there yeah. yeah yeah that was pretty cool i've yeah you don't expect it in mass but yeah walked right up on them going oh, that's a little bit big for a whitetail yeah <laughs> I think you can probably find some good moose sheds yeah. here because you can't hunt them and they're they got big yeah yeah you know, big racks. I was seeing a lot of black bear late season, you know, um, which was unusual. I thought they would have been kind of holed up by then, but that's what I was seeing a lot of. Hmm. Of course, I I went to northern New Hampshire, did some messing around up in there, but it's I don't know. I think. Um, they need to start changing some of their rules regulations up there because I think what's happened is that they changed that that doe season and they shorten that up. In some cases, there's no doe season, so everybody hunts bucks, you know. Yeah. And typically, some of the areas I went, I hiked that six and a half miles one day, and I would typically go to these areas where there's always a buck kicking around, and, and I didn't cut one track. Mm. Um, and there was a few different areas that I went to, and I didn't cut hardly any tracks. And it was kind of unusual in these spots. So I don't know what's going on, you know. I hear a lot of guys, you know, grumbling and mumbling about the doe season and everybody's chasing bucks and, you know, the big mature bucks have, they've taken, you know, they've taken a hit up there, you know. Was well, there a lot of snow up there this year? It was, um... Not a, a ton of snow. It it definitely got crunchy. You know, it was some of the you know bad conditions. Um, <clears throat> I got some of that stuff. It was like I took a little video. You know, just crunch, crunch, crunch. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> like um, I was just thinking, but well, you're talking about mass and not really even Western mass having much snow this year. That's probably good for the deer herd. I bet a lot oh, of them. Oh, sure, yeah. It's going to be phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Just, I mean, just the fact that the trackers weren't able to, you know, yeah. shoot a lot of the big bucks. Because last year, a lot of them got killed when the snow happened. You yeah. Know, some really yeah. good Massachusetts bucks. But mm. both uh, the fact that you guys didn't get much tracking snow down here this year and then um, that the winters will be, you know, should be easy as long as we don't get giant snowstorms late here. No, I think we're A lot of young bucks. Good you know yeah it's been yeah. everywhere throughout new england i mean yeah there's been whether you know in maine it's like you know new hampshire it seems like there's a lot of those you know two and a half three and a half year olds so mm. these next couple of years should be real promising yeah mm. but yeah i'm excited 
Yeah. It's already another season. Did a little bit. This is a little set. Little set I found here. Well, it's not ending for me. I'm still going. Yeah, you're still going. <laughs> Look at you. Wait, where where are you going? <laughs> So we're headed out to Alabama Friday. Oh, yeah, this is their rut, isn't gonna it? going to go to Alabama yeah, Slammer? Yeah, peak of the rut. Peak of the rut right now. Alabama yeah. Slammer. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, we we would, this is our third year going down there, and we didn't realize we were down there and, um, <clears throat> that they extended the season to get into that. The state extended that last week to get into the more of the rut down there. So last year was our first year to get to that late season and uh, of course you know everything's you know everything's shut down up here and you would not imagine that peak of the rut is this late down yeah. there yeah yeah we got down there last year and sure enough and uh, crazy because like i said it before we had we had found the spot to hunt <clears throat> and uh, of course down there you it you can't you have to either hunt with a guide there's no public ground hardly anywhere down there or you have to lease so we had i think mark woodman found this place and a great great guys just uh it was like ten thousand acres or something like that but just great all-around guys um really took a liking to us because we're from way up here you know new england yeah. so we had went down there and we said we decided that uh, we're going to stay in our stands all day because that's how we hunt, you know. We're New England boys. We're going to get at it and give it all we got, you know. <laughs> so they thought we were the craziest sums of bitches that I ever met. Who stays in their stand all day? Says, well, we do. Well, you know, we're out of our stands by 8.30, 9 o'clock, that's it. We don't yeah. see nothing. Well, all right, well, whatever. <laughs> First day we got in our stands. It's the rut. Dude. Yeah, we yeah. packed yeah. our lunches, and we're in there all day long. And we saw, we saw a lot, you know. I'm sure, especially midday that, too. That midday yeah. transition, you know. They know when the hunters are leaving the woods. They're not stupid. We came out that night, you know. We got back, and you could, could We got a standing ovation. No, I shit you <laughs> not. The guy come up. And he's he said, I gotta tell you something right now. I've never met anybody that stayed in this. We thought you were crazy. We thought you were kidding. And they were all clapping, and they thought we we're whacked up but after that they all came up to us what'd you see did you guys see anything what was it like out there it was like in another <laughs> world you know what do you mean what was it like out there? you guys don't stay no we don't we you know we're from south you know but <clears throat> yeah so we're going back this uh, i think gonna be our last year down there we're gonna because we always like to try to try something new try something new yeah. <clears throat> you know we've uh you know with mark with the muzzle loaders Mark and uh, we've always done stuff, you know, late season or travel somewhere to change it up. So this will be our last year down there. But it's great, great hunting down there. It's yeah. crazy. What you, did you you get one last year down there or no? I passed on everything. I shot one. Uh, I shot a thirteen pointer the year before. Um, I was the only guy in camp that shot a buck because I wanted to go into the swamps. Yeah. Nobody would go into the swamps but me. So I went down in there and that's where I got. But this the last year I passed. I was gonna shoot some wild boars, but I was kinda holding off on the wild boars until, you know, I I would see a mature buck, but it just never yeah. never panned out. Now going in the swamps down there, do you have to worry about all kinds of creepy crawlies or No, well that's yeah, that's yeah. I would think in February they're probably dormant, but no, they're dormant. Everything's dormant. When we first started going there, hey, we saw some lizards and stuff like that. It's just a different. It's 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 a different country down there. Yeah. A lot of pitch pines. Yeah. Uh, the swamp. A lot of. Um, I don't know what kind of brush they call it. It's just like, it's like short whippets, and you got to get through them, and, you know, in a lot of hogs down there. Yeah. Alabama's not a baiting state, is it, or is it? No, no, hmm. not that I know of. You know, I don't. I, was I don't know. Say if Texas will be one of those places you can go get a cool rut hunt late, but I don't like, you know, just sitting over the bait pile. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it's um. Yeah, there's a lot of places that bait. In some cases, you know, like I hunted North Carolina and South Carolina, and if you don't bait down there, you don't have deer on your property. I know. That's the thing. Once they make it a law, then 
you're out of the game if you don't. Well, what do it is it. a lot of their country down there is just not a lot of minerals and stuff like that. So if you don't bait, you don't have deer. They just move to the next farm mm -hmm. or the next ranch. That was even like when I was down in Ohio. Texas is like, like that. <clears throat> that's how it was down there. There was, yeah. I mean, there was private land, and of course there was public mm -hmm. land where I was hunting, and so it's like all the deer. Some of them they would actually stay on on the public. You yeah, know, that, that's where they would bed. But they were all going over to the private because there was feeders set up over there and everything else. And yeah, yeah, uh, Maryland is like that. They there's uh, all the outfitters. They bait all those sick of deer in the whitetail. Hmm. And yeah, it's just common. But I, I I you know I don't have a problem with people baiting. I don't really care. You still got to go up and kill them. But the thing with baiting to me is that I've been around baiting. I've experienced it. I've seen it that in a lot of cases you're getting all the young deer does fawns and stuff like that it's not that often in certain cases that you're going to see those big mature bucks show up they do show up occasionally but yeah those those big old bucks are back off you know that's true so mm -hmm. yeah yeah in some cases you got it i mean think of people out there that you know handicap people you know people with disabilities is that you have to have things like that for them you know yep. Yep. so it's all good you know 100 percent. so how, how would you guys think of the uh <clears throat> we should wrap this up in a second here but yeah. what'd you guys think of the hunting with the henry's this year I, it was great i mean they're awesome yeah. guns. I, for me it's like you know when we were kind of asked about it and approached about the idea of you know hunting with lever guns obviously big woods bucks is known for his pump guns yep um and mm. so for Hold on a second. Well, not everyone. Not everyone. We're back up there. There's a couple of us that. You know, well, no, not everyone. But right. I'm just saying in general, it's like, and so I had I hadn't grown up hunting with a pump gun. I had hunted <clears throat> with a bolt action growing up. So I, it's only the last few years that I had switched to using a pump gun. So for me, it was still kind of a foreign action that I was still trying to get used to. Mm. Um, and since I'm used to doing something in my right hand, working a bolt, the idea of using a lever gun, I mean, sounded awesome to me. So it's you know taking some getting used to, but. I really enjoyed it, and the Henrys, you know, are, are great guns. Mm. Um, you know, the Skinner scope, I loved having that on there. Um, I wish I'd gotten to use it like you did, but as far as carrying it around through the woods, yeah. I mean, just I was looking forward to being able to cycle that action. And with these Henrys, I mean, one thing that was awesome about it with that 360 uh, buck hammer, because it's 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 not like a long round, so that action's nice and short. It, yeah, it's straight wall cartridge. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you the one thing I I liked about that gun. And I shot a, I shot it a lot this year. Uh, there are states, um, in particular Maryland, Illinois, and a lot of other states that that fits within their criteria of a straight wall cartridge. Yeah. So Maryland, you can hunt on some of that federal ground with a straight wall cartridge, and that's hmm. the gun right there. Illinois, it's a shotgun state. Um, that gun right there fits in their straight wall cartridge. You can use that gun hmm. along with muzzle loaders. So, like you're like you were talking about hunting with a muzzle loader. You had that one shot. You yeah. wish you had brought yeah. your shotgun. Yeah. Well, that there's some that, states that are trying to introduce yeah. that. Like so, for instance, like I know oh, there well, that was, would be if that if Massachusetts <laughs> allows a straight wall cartridge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's at, a 200 yard gun right at there. At this point, it's like you might as well. It's like because right. shotguns, it's almost the same thing as a shotgun. It, yeah. It you know it's just. Right. It, it's a rifle so um like i know even in like southern new hampshire they have you know your shotgun and muzzleloader only zone mm -hmm. uh, but down there there's there's what is it there's, i know there's like 40 like 44 mag you can use that 44 in a rifle. magnum yeah uh it's straight wall cartridge i think the is I'm it not, 450 can you use a bush master I don't, I don't know i just know that 360 falls within it matt hunter with a 44 I like 44s. Well, wait, wait, it doesn't it doesn't fall within it yet, right? Like the 360 in Yeah, in, you can hunt. Yeah. No, no, I'm saying Southern New Hampshire though. Oh, so, Southern New Hampshire. I don't know. But like where I was going with that is is that like a lot of states where they do allow some of those, you know, yeah. those those <clears throat> lesser calibers, I guess, you know, less mm -hmm. distance calibers, something like the, you know, the the 360 buck hammer hopefully mm -hmm. will get, you know, introduced and passed into law in some of those states because it is a, a yeah. great option for that and I mean, I know it's like, you know, even for us, it's like when, you know, we had the opportunity to partner with Henry. I mean, a lot of us, you know, myself and Jeff included, it's like, you know, 
we would have preferred, you know, some of the rifle rounds, but at the timing of it, you know, it's like yeah. with the 360 Buckhammer coming out, it's it's what they had right before hunting season started. So I know we've gotten a lot of questions about, you know, it's like why why the 360 Buckhammer? It's a great it's a great caliber, especially it's in those It's a states. working man's gun. Yeah. No, no 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 kidding. That gun there is it. I mean, I've shot lever actions my entire life, and you know Winchester so on and so forth. And I still have them, but that is a working man's gun no doubt yep without a doubt so yeah and with remington's new cartridge i mean you know, we were asked to try out mm -hmm. the 360 buck hammer and it worked great for for the team mm -hmm. members that used it and were successful with it yeah um, <clears throat> yeah i mean so that, that's fantastic i mean yeah are you gonna are you gonna shoot you know planes game are you gonna shoot you know long distance elk you know mule deer well not at distance, but anything within, you know, that 200 yard range. Yeah. Yeah, it's comfortable. Yeah. Oh yeah, and and I mean the recoil. I mean, yeah, I mean, on that it's smooth. very minimal. Yeah, it's super smooth. Hmm. Um, it's like shooting a lot. Uh, to me, what I, I was amazed with it, it was kind of like my wife shoots a seven millimeter 08, and that is the smoothest gun I've ever shot. Right, that is just as smooth as her gun. Yeah. You know, it is a lever action. You know, but you. You know, you still got to jack one in the chamber, but you have that ability for that second round right there. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. and then when you get proficient at it, too, I mean, I've seen guys, they know how to, when you know how oh to yeah. work that thing, I mean, it's almost like a semi-automatic. Yeah. What's yeah. his name on your team there? Uh, New Hampshire, White Mountain. Brad. Oh, Brad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 see, he works it really well. Yeah. Yep. yeah they are fast action. Yeah, it's yeah. smooth. Yeah, and with that shorter action, too, I mean, it, it's nice and crisp the way it goes through. And Yeah, it was it, it was a great gun. I mean, what I liked about it too is that you know, of course, you can load it both ways. You have the side gate, yeah. then yep. the yeah, tube. So it's like about, an old yeah. twenty Springfield twenty two. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I was like, "What the? What is that?" Because I yeah, I just haven't I seen it. Loader. I haven't seen it on a <laughs> rifle like that before. Yeah, you tip it up, up yeah. and drop all your bullets out yep. of there. So how how many can you fit in there? Is it? It's a five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. typical five. So. You would load the one in and drop drop four down. Yeah. Same yeah. thing on loading. You you know take the tube out. The the four would come out and then you just take the one out of the chamber. But yeah, it's a great alternative because plus two. You know I know safety is one thing that's been brought up. You know quite a bit. Um, you know I know like Mark can explain it better. But like even with the safety and stuff on it, the way it engages with a hammer, um, when you you know when you work the lever and work the action on it, it it's safer you know as far as that but you have the option of the tube too you don't have to worry yeah. about you know about doing it all five times to eject all the rounds yeah yeah that's how i always had to do it with my 32 special you just eject eject five times i got good at catching yeah, catching yeah. the bullet you yeah. know yeah well, for us in maryland i mean going through those swamps through that 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 ice of course i put a little post out there going through there you know in um uh, Greg was in front of me. I was behind him. We're going and just busting through the ice. And Greg is using his as a crutch, and I'm using mine. You know, and of course we had somebody comment on that post about you know, geez, I hope you know, I hope nobody shoots anybody. Blah blah blah. But of course, you know, our guns are unloaded, and always we're always thinking safety. But once you get through that thing, they're so easy to load up. You just pull the tube out, drop your shots in there. Yeah drop it back in there cock it you're ready to go so it's yeah. that easy you know yep. but <clears throat> yeah great guns i mean they're i've shot coyotes oh I mean... the thing about it too is that compared to i mean probably any other gun that i've had as far as especially with the scope like i notice it especially when you put up the magnification mm. it balances phenomenal mm. it's like the way those crosshairs hold it's been as far as like the most balanced and steady you know holding crosshairs of any gun that I've had so yeah. far. Hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do with what we talked about earlier is because a lot of times you have that, you know, I don't know what you call it, it's like but that spot that dips down a little bit, but with it being as straight as it is, it keeps all that weight completely stabilized. Mm -hmm. So Well, like Neil said, I mean, you got to be honest here, we're kind of, at first we're kind of skeptical because we all use different guns. I mean, I'm an automatic guy, Pump, Rick, you know, and to bring the Henry to the forefront for us. I mean, of course, lever action, 360. They do make a, another 308 model, which we're, yeah. some of us were more interested because you could reach out and, yeah. you know, for, all, for us traveling, it'd yeah. be great, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're kind of, I mean, I was 
kind of skeptical at first, you know, but now I'm not skeptical with it. I mean, that's just a great gun. Yeah. And I've, I mean, I've used it this year without a doubt. I mean, and mine's all beat up and yeah, it's a working man's gun. It's a good yeah. gun. Yeah. My guns are great. I mean, the caliber is, is good for what it is in the right situations. And yeah, yeah. I know they've worked on it quite a bit cause they want to have it, you know, in those States that, you know, allow the yeah. straight wall calibers. So it's not, and it's, and I'm not a salesman and I'm not trying to sell you that gun and I've got tons of guns, but yeah, that, that's, that's going with me to Alabama. I feel that conf confident with it. It's comfortable yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that mid range shooting is great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, well, guys, thanks for coming down. Yeah. yeah thanks for having yeah, us. Every time. Yeah. Well, we'll have finally seen the studio. It's like, yeah, I, it's awesome. I feel like I should have got down here sooner, but yeah. yeah. Came out great. I didn't get to spend much time during the deer season. I didn't even pop in here really much, but uh, so I'm just back into it now, working on hunt stock stuff. I'm here every day. Yeah, hunt yeah. stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's we cool. Know it, huh? yeah. That's yeah, it's coming got up. Got the New York thing coming up. Before we but... know it, New York happening. Yeah, yeah. it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, yeah. we got our spring thaw event coming up. Yeah, spring thaw is coming up March thirtieth. 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 Platstown, New Hampshire. So yep. So we, we outgrew. It's like our in-house location up at Parlin Lodge. Yeah. So we need to, you know find another venue so we decided to move it more centrally located for everybody instead of way up yeah. way up north yeah. yeah yeah i liked it up there just because it gave me the excuse to go to jack yeah i don't yeah. get i don't go there very often yeah and... yeah you made the most of the trip yeah yeah but yeah so yeah i mean looking forward to seeing everyone at all the events here coming up over this spring and summer it's it's going to be great great off season so definitely it's time to share the stories and yeah and see if, everyone. i don't know if you guys are um keying in on it or, or not but the film festival in massachusetts too i don't know if you guys are gonna be putting any films together for that or big woods bucks but um, when is that that's we're doing a film festival on the thursday night before okay. stock starts we've got a right now we're up to twenty five hundred dollar first place prize fifteen hundred dollar second place prize thousand dollar third place vortex just Put in um, uh, eight hundred and forty dollar um, tripod. Is know. that something you're doing yourself? Huntstock, yeah. Huntstock oh, so, is doing uh, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're just like the master of that stuff. You know, I got to give you credit. You what credit is due? I mean, you <laughs> something just, just happened with that. Yeah, it was like the lens closed, didn't yeah. it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it did. It did. Was, it might, it might have just died on us, but. We drained the battery. Drained yeah. the battery. We're yeah. hungry. Let's go eat Yeah. <laughs> thanks know? for coming down, guys. I appreciate. All right. It. Thanks for having us, Pat. This show is brought to you by Huntstock, America's reinvented hunting show. Tickets and info at www.huntstockevents.com. What's going on, everybody? We're at Huntstock. So you guys need to come to this. If you've been to other local shows that are outdoor shows, this is nothing like girls. This is like a giant deer camp. A bunch of like-minded people that are enthusiastic and excited about what they do. We had a great time here at Huntstock. This is an awesome event. What do you think, guys? Okay. One of the best shows that I've ever been to, really. More deer hunters here than others anywhere. I think this is one of the greatest shows right now in the hunting world. There's no question. Down here at Huntstock 2023, had a great time. Better than expected, better than the year before, and I think it's growing, and next year will be even better. I gotta admit, this has been one of the most largest, best shows I've ever been to. It's like a giant deer camp. The feeling that comes to this place has just been absolutely awesome. This is something you're not gonna wanna miss in the future. The value of coming to this show is so phenomenal. That $40 buys you non-stop, you almost can't get to them all seminars from some of the best people in the industry in the Northeast. Huntstock is it. This is the premier show on the Northeast. Everybody is at this show telling stories, showing things off, and waiting for you guys to show up. Come on out, we'll be waiting for you here next year.